these days. So yeah. probably <laughs> some drinks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right, perfect. Just as the YouTube kicks in, excellent. Um, all right, well, let's kick off then. Where's Michelle? Michelle, you're good. I'm ready. All right, cool. Let's get to it then. Good evening and welcome to the April 19th, 2021 meeting of the City of Summit Zoning Board of Adjustment. My name is Stephen Spur and I am chairman of the Summit Zoning Board. In accordance with New Jersey Statute 10 4 10, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to a newspaper of record and has been posted here in City Hall. This meeting is a judicial proceeding. Any questions or comments must be limited to the issues that are relevant to what the board may legally consider in reaching a decision and decorum appropriate to a judicial proceeding, judicial hearing rather, uh, must be maintained at all times. This meeting is being conducted virtually via video conferencing in lieu of meeting in the council chamber at Summit City Hall, Summit, New Jersey. This meeting is being live streamed to the city's YouTube page. In addition, members of the public can view and participate in the meeting by following the link provided on the agenda. Members of the public may also submit written comments and questions to the zoning board secretary in advance of the meeting to be read aloud during the meeting. Such written comments shall not be considered testimonial and shall not be considered by the board in its determination on any application. Individuals wishing to provide testimony as to any application must participate virtually with both audio and video enabled. Andy Ball is the zoning board's attorney. He will advise the board members on matters of law and is the key interface with the applicant's attorney. Mr. Ball does not vote on the applications. Chris Nicola is a city employee and is the zoning board secretary. Mr. Nicola works with applicants on getting their applications together, planning our agendas, and keeping our meeting minutes. Mr. Nicola also does not vote on the applications. Our board consists of seven regular members and up to four alternates. All members can participate in the hearings tonight, but a maximum of seven can vote. Most applications require a simple majority to be approved. Some applications require five affirmative votes to be approved. You'll be told which majority will be required before we begin our deliberations. Mr. Nicola, please call the roll of the members. For uh, Chairman Spur. Here. Vice Chairwoman Newell. Here. Yuko. Here. Steiner. Here. Mr. Mullen is excused and Ms. Schwartzstein is excused. Mr. Millay. Here. Mr. Leikitz. Here. Ms. Toth. Here. Ms. Sager. Here. And Dr. Levine is excused. We have a quorum. We can proceed. We generally hear the cases in the order they are listed on the agenda. We try not to have each hearing last no more. We have we try to have each hearing last no more than 30 minutes, but we do understand that some cases are too complex to be heard within that time frame. Each hearing begins with the applicant or their attorney giving an overview of the application and the variances that are required. We then hear from any expert witnesses the applicant may have to help explain the application and why the variances are needed. The board members may ask questions of the applicant, their attorney, and the expert witnesses. Once the board members and the board professionals are done with the, uh, their questioning, the public will have an opportunity to ask questions. This is not the time to tell us what you think about this case. That, uh, the opportunity comes at the end of the hearing. Before you ask questions, we need to know who you are and where you live. It is important that our court reporter be able to keep a clear and accurate public record. Please state your name before speaking or asking a question. And please do not talk over each other. This is even more important under the current circumstances. After all witnesses have been heard, members of the audience have their second opportunity to speak, and at that time may express your opinion, positive or negative, about the application. Then the public hearing is closed and we go into executive session, where the board members discuss the case and vote. You will be able to listen to our executive session, but you will not normally be able to participate in our discussion. Most applications are heard and decided in the same evening. If a case requires additional information or testimony that cannot be presented tonight, we will carry your case to another date and it will not be decided tonight. Krista Anderson, the city zoning officer, has asked that I remind all applicants that they must read carefully the resolution that documents the zoning board's decision and to pay particular attention to the conditions contained in the resolution. For example, if a landscaping plan is required, you must obtain one and submit it to John Linson, the city's forester. If a grading plan is required, you must have one prepared by a civil engineer and submit three copies along with the application fee to the city's engineering division. Failure to satisfy all conditions in a resolution will result in a delay in approving your application as it will cause extra work for city zoning staff. The resolutions documenting the board's decision will normally be available one month after we decide the case. When I call your name, please tell me how many witnesses you have and whether you think you can complete your case within 30 minutes. First on the agenda is Kem and Heather Blacker for 29 Waldron Avenue. 
Are you here? Oh, I see you there. You hop off mute real quick. Hello. Good evening. Uh, do you have an attorney this evening or will you be representing yourself? Uh, we're here, but our architect is also here, Jack Kelly. Excellent. All right. And then do you anticipate your case taking 30 minutes or, uh, or more this evening? I hope not. <laughs> All right. Uh, second on the agenda is Mr. Chester LLC. Who's here? Hi, this, this is attorney Jude Avellino. We should be, we have one witness who is Mr. Rosen, who the board is very familiar with. We should be half an hour or less, I hope. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Avellino. And then second, uh, third rather, NTL Development LLC 26 and 32 Ashwood Avenue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just spoke with Mr. Sheehan and he was having some audio issues, but I do see him on the bottom left. All right. Mr. Sheehan is third on the agenda tonight. Um, so we'll let him resolve his audio visual issues uh, in anticipation for the start of that case. Uh, with that, we can begin with 29 Waldron Avenue, for which I am recused. So I will hold, uh, turn the gavel over to my able uh, uh, vice chair, Liz Newell. Thanks, Steve. See you in a few. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Blacker. Yes. And let me swear each of you in before we begin here. If you could each raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matters, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. And please state your name, spell your last name for the record, one at a time, please. My name is Heather Blacker, B-L-A-C-K-E-R. My name is Kem Blacker, B-L-A-C-K-E-R, last name. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your department? <clears throat> What, what we're asking uh, permission to do is to replace the undersized garage with a proper two, uh, two up with a proper size two car garage. Awesome, thank you. And you said your architect is here, Jack Kelly? Yes. Okay, Mr. Kelly. Right, and I will swear you in as well, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And please state your name, spell your last name. Jack Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Thank you. And okay. sorry, oh, Liz, were you going to jump in? or? Yeah, he's been here um, a few times. <laughs> Got it. So I imagine then the board would like to accept your credentials as an architect at this point. Wonderful, thank you, and we will. Hi, Mr. Kelly, why don't you tell us about this project? Sure, um, I think it's a pretty straightforward application. We are replaced, we are seeking to replace a uh, existing two car detached garage with a properly sized new detar detached garage um, that um, actually will accommodate two cars. Um, the current garage is about 19 feet wide, and so on the inside dimension is about 18 feet wide. Um, it, and so it really doesn't, uh, doesn't accommodate two cars properly. You could, I, I would imagine that if you pulled two cars in, you couldn't get out of your car. So we're looking to just expand it a little bit in both the width and the depth to accommodate two cars. Um, that results in three variances. Uh, the first one being building coverage. I'll just go through the variances and then uh, I, I'll address some of uh, Krista's comments. So the first variance is for building coverage. Uh, the existing condition is 21.6% and we're seeking a small increase of 1.8%, which brings us to 23.4. Uh, the, exist, the, the allowables condition for the R10 zone is 18%. Uh, there's a small increase in lot coverage of 1.3%. So we're going from 36 to 37.3, and the maximum allowed is 35. The third variance is because is for a side yard setback to the to the structure because the garage is not entirely located in the rear yard. Uh, we chose not to put the new garage all the way back in the required rear yard only because it, it would create a lot more pavement uh, and exacerbate the lot coverage. Uh, we'd have to move it back around 
12 or 14 feet, which creates a lot more asphalt in the backyard and uh, would make the lot coverage situation a lot worse. So basically the new garage is right in the same location as the current garage. The front wall of the new structure is right where the front wall of the existing structure is. We are moving it over just a bit to the right uh, so that the new setback on the side is, is being increased from 3.3 feet to four feet. And we're proposing a, removing some asphalt there. They share a garage with their neighbors. So um, there's a lot of asphalt between the two properties. So we're gonna subtract some of that uh, so that we can plant some, uh, plant some uh, landscaping between the two properties to give the, them a little privacy and to, and to screen the screen, uh, provide a little screening for their neighbor. One other thing I'll mention on building coverage, uh, because their patio is a couple steps off the ground in the back, we needed to count that in building coverage. And that accounts for about three and a half percent of the statistic. So uh, I realized that we're asking for 23%, but keep in mind that about three and a half percent of that is the patio, which is just a couple steps off the ground, but not close enough to the ground uh, where it wouldn't count. The new structure itself is conforming uh, to, to the maximum allowable footprint, which is 24 by 24, and it conforms to the maximum height, which is 15 feet. Um, I'm gonna let, is Mr. Clark with us? Yes, his name is there. Uh, I'll let I'm him- I'm here, I'm here. Okay, I'll let him talk about the, um, the uh, drainage and the increase in the lot coverage. Krista had one other comment, which I, I'll address. She mentioned the, uh, we're, we're showing um, some decorative carriage lights on the front of the garage. And her comment was about uh, light spillage on their neighbor prop the neighbor's property. So my, my response to that is we'll come up with a solution that will satisfy uh, the zoning officer. Either we'll put a shield on the, on the light or we'll use a different kind of light, which, uh, which which the Blackers and I talked about last week, perhaps the light just shines down instead of outward. So in any case, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, satisfy her concern on that. I think that's really it. Uh, let Mr. Clark, if, if, unless you have questions for me. Any questions from our board professionals? Nothing at this time. Okay, any questions from our board? Uh, if I may, on the second page of Krista, she's talking about that we may or may not want to talk about the non-conforming porch. And she's not talking about lights. She's talking about the setback. Yes. Well, she does mention the lights on page one. On page All right. Well, let's, let's talk about page two. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not sure what to make of that comment. The, the house was built in 1900 and the porch is original. And, and so she is pointing out the fact that the porch is too close to the street. Um, she also points out that it's, uh, you know, that it's, uh, it's original to the house. And, you know, I, I don't know what she's trying to say in that comment, but I certainly would not advocate that we, we uh, demolish that porch. It's I think she's looking for us to perhaps make a uh, creative variance there so that it can stay. Uh, perhaps with the condition that if it were ever to be destroyed, it would not be replaced. Okay. Well, I, I would believe that's what I'm reading there, but I'm not sure. I, I, I read it a little differently. I read it as saying <laughs> that it, if if we grant a variance tonight, they could rebuild it without needing to come then for a variance. So we could save the current owner or any maybe any future owner for needing to come for a variance should it become destroyed by a tree falling on it or they mm -hmm. just want to replace it. Uh, we could grant that variance now, or we can make them come back later on if they want to rebuild it. So I, th I think that's what she's trying to say. Yeah, that's right. And it, clearly, if it's original to the house dating back to 1900, it predates the zoning of the um, the property, and it would be a pre-existing non-conforming use. So it can stay there as it currently is. Um, if it was ever to be destroyed, then technically it would have to be rebuilt in compliance. So if that is a concern and if the board was inclined to grant a variance for it, that would save them the hassle if it is destroyed. 
but otherwise they can make routine repairs um, to it if it's ever you know damaged or needs to be uh, slightly repaired. Thank you, Andy. I have a quick question for the blackers. So are you going to be able to pull in and then pull out of your garage? Because it just seems kind of narrow. Um, like I know I would have an issue pulling out without hitting something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, the hope is that we can pull our cars straight into the garage. And the, the driveway uh, is set up so that um, we do have a pretty nice straight uh, route to the garage from the street and then back out to the street. So um, we've gotten uh, pretty good at backing up and, and getting to the street safely. We don't do it quite, we don't do it quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board? No, seeing none. Okay, um, Mr. Clark. Um, all right, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And please state your name, spell your last name. Andrew Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. And I believe Mr. Clark has been recently qualified in front of the board as well. Are there any additional questions or concerns from the board? Oh, go uh, right ahead, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Um, with regards to the stormwater on this project, it's a little bit of a unique condition. It sometimes happens, but not often. Um, there was a previous project that was done, I believe in around 2006 or 2007, an addition was um, constructed um, to the dwelling. And at the time, uh, drywall was required due to the uh, proposed project. What ended up getting constructed and designed, in fact, was uh, a drywall with a little bit of extra capacity um, uh, intended in the, in the design. Uh, that would allow us to connect the new garage roof leaders directly to that dry well, and that that dry well um, can, can handle that additional runoff. Um, it's not a lot of additional runoff, but it can handle that capacity based on the design. I did uh, attempt to articulate all that in a note on the plan, um, but that, that's, that's uh, the condition in this case. So any increase in coverage, building or um, impervious, uh, will be mitigated by um, the, the existing dry well that has surplus capacity. And to my knowledge is functioning um, just fine. Thank you. Any questions from our board of professionals? None at this time. Thank you. Any questions from our board? Yep, I did forget to go to the public. Um, any questions for Mr. Kelly or Mr. Clark? Mm, no. Okay. That's a quick one. All right. Um, Mr. Ball, any conditions? I didn't have any particular conditions. The one we always note is that the applicants would comply with all the conditions previously noted in the engineer's report. And we're not going to do anything with the uh, the the porch, we're gonna just leave it be. Assuming the applicants are not requesting a variance at this point, I don't necessarily see a requirement to address it unless the board feels otherwise. Okay, thank you. Um, and then any questions, any comments from the general public? Okay, okay. We're gonna start our deliberations. Who would like to start? I'll, I'll start just to get it going. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a reasonable, it's a reasonable case. I mean, I think they definitely, I could see the need for a more practical type garage. And I'm happy that they um, are leaving it in roughly the same location rather than putting in a conforming location because as, as it was noted, that would increase uh, lot cover significantly, take away some, you know, ground air and replace it with pavement. So that, that, that's a good thing. The other variances, I'm, I'm not troubled by them at all. Um, glad to hear the comment about uh, addressing the lights on the garage. Uh, so with all that said, uh, I'm, I would be in favor of this application. Thank you. Should we add that uh, light thing as a condition 
Andy, or because it's not in the engineer's report, it's in Krista's report. Uh, it was provided in testimony that they will comply with that requirement. If you wanted to give specifics as far as a condition goes, that is something we can add in if you feel it's necessary. I leave it to the chair. I think we're good. Uh, we have it on record. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments about this application? <laughs> All right, so I will agree with Mr. Yuko. Um, I think it's a modest addition and it's a practical um, one, having, having the, the garage in the back and having it being housed with two cars. So this gets them off the street and then the driveway. So I would be, um, I would definitely approve this application. All right, so do we have a motion? I will move to approve. Thank you. I, I will second. Awesome. Thank you. Chris? Mr. Luca? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Mr. Malay? Yes. Mr. Loikitz? Yes. Ms. Toth? Yes. Ms. Sager? Yes. And Vice Chairwoman Noel? Yes. Uh, good luck with your project. Very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Up next, uh, Mr. Chester LLC. Uh, Jude. Um, yes. There you go. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> welcome <there>. back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just want me to just get started, Ms. Newell? Sure. Thank okay. you. So good evening, Ms. Newell, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, and Mr. Ball. Uh, as many of you may know, my name is A. Jude Avellino of Avellino Law, and I'm the attorney for an LLC known as Mr. Chester LLC, which owns a property um, known as 120 Hobart Avenue. Um, we are seeking two C variances, one for the construction of a port cochere and the other one for maximum uh, lot coverage. Our, my clients purchased the home last year, uh, fell in love with the neighborhood and wanted to continue to raise their children in Summit. Uh, they're seeking to make improvements to the exterior exterior of the house and backyard. Um, they would like to create an outdoor living space that is more conducive to their current lifestyle while keeping historic charm, character, history, and style of the home. Um, again, the first variance is for a court cochere. I would like to point out that, number one, if my friends from Queens knew that I was using the phrase court cochere, they would laugh me out of the room. Um, but more importantly, I'd like to point out that a port cocher is not a carport. So 35-7.2 of the code defines a carport as a roof structure providing space for the parking or storage of motor vehicles and enclosed on not more than three sides. Again, my clients are not looking to build a carport. Our, our clients are looking to build a port cocher, which is a covered entrance for vehicles to pass through. Um, the port cochere is a practical purpose um, of a, a covered space to drop people off or to unload groceries uh, by a mudroom. It adds historic charm to the home. It's designed to blend into the home. I'd like to point out that there, is, there already is a garage to park cars and store cars. There are also approximately seven homes in a neighborhood that have port cochers. Three are immediately um, near 120 Hobart. They are 124 Hobart, which is next door, 107 Hobart diagonally across the street, and a home on the corner of Hobart and Springfield Avenue. Um, in its comments, the historical, uh, sorry, the Historic Preservation Commission noted that the proposed Port Cochere on this 1900 Colonial Revival home fits well in this north side historic district where there are many homes with Port Cochers, and that the Port Cochere matches the existing house and makes it an elegant addition. Uh, the Historical Preservation Commission has no exception to the application. Um, I think that the Port Cocher will improve the beauty and character of the home and it's architecturally appropriate. It's also set back appropriately from the street. The second variance that we're seeking is for maximum lot coverage. This is a pre-existing non-conforming condition. As we know, the allowed coverage is 30%. 
the existing coverage is 33.6% and the proposed coverage is 33.1%. So the proposed changes actually get us closer um, to compliance um, and reduce existing coverage. The positive criteria are that the changes promote a desirable visual environment, preserving the character of the original home, creating an outdoor living space that is more conducive to modern day living. The proposed exterior will blend with the mass scale and architecture of the home. The stormwater management is above and beyond what is required and the benefits of deviation outweigh any detriment. The negative criteria is that there is no detriment to the neighborhood character. Again, the surrounding homes have undergone similar improvements, uh, most notably by the seven homes nearby that have port co-shares. Uh, there's no adverse effect on adjoining properties or the city. Um, the zoning plan and ordinances will not be substantially impaired by granting the variances. Um, the port co-chair and other yard improvements will not cause undesirable noise, light, glare, odors, or other burdens to the adjoining properties in the neighborhood, and this will not negatively impact the surrounding property owners. Um, with that, unless there are any questions from the board, I'd like to introduce uh, my first witness, David Rosen. Sure, let me just, any questions from our board professionals or the board? Nothing at this time. Okay, okay. go ahead, Mr. Avelina. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce my first witness. Again, the board is very familiar with uh, architect David Rosen. And Mr. Rosen, if you could, you swear affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And please state your name, spell your last name. Uh, Dave Rosen, R-O-S-E-N. Uh, I'm an architect, a partner in Rosen, Kelly Conway, and I have appeared before this board um, uh, many times. And I once again imagine that the board would like to admit you as an expert witness, unless there's any concerns. Oh, that's correct. Thanks. All right, counsel, your witness. David, um, I think maybe it's best uh, if you just explain the project and what we're trying to do here. Uh, that would be great. Um, uh, question, question for Chris uh, Nicola. You have the drawings. Yeah, if you want to refer to those, um, should I share or should you share a screen? Um, whatever works better for you. If you want me to pull them up, I can. Um, I have the website open. So. Um, either way, I have mine set up in order, if that's, if that's helpful for you. Um, yeah, that would probably be easier if you have everything set up already. Okay. Um, so assuming I'm a good. Okay, <clears throat> can everybody see the, the drawings? Okay, I'm going to move through this. Jude covered a lot of this already, uh, but I just wanted to cover a variety of things here. First is that this is the appearance of the house um, as it is right now. Uh, we had just finished, a, we're just finishing up a project uh, for the owner to move in. This is a new addition on the upper left of this. Uh, so that represents what the what the house is. It's slightly different from the photos that I'll show you in one, one moment. What we're proposing to add is uh, this port cachere. Uh, let me use this as a pointer. So this port cachere is a drive-through. And as Jude mentioned, a port cachere is, is not, a, it's not a French carport. Um, it is, it is a passage through. Uh, the easiest way to find that is you just Google it and Port Cachere says a covered entrance large enough for vehicles to pass through, typically opening onto a courtyard. And in North America, it's called, they, they also define it as a porch where vehicles stop to discharge passengers. And even if you go into Wikipedia and anybody is welcome to do that if you want uh, during the the hearing, it, it, it defines it and it is not mentioned as a carport because a carport is really a destination. A carport is an open-sided garage, which is for the storing of vehicles. This, this port cachere is different in a number of ways. First of all, it is over the driveway, which wraps around to the back of the house to the garage. 
if somebody parks here, it's like parking anywhere else on the driveway. It blocks access from the street to the garage or from the garage coming out. So it's not a permanent, um, it's not a permanent place for the storage of motor vehicles. Uh, it is a very nice convenience because coming in here, a car can stop here and there's enough room, they come up the steps and they'll come in the door. You notice that there's a door facing front uh, on this drawing. We are taking that drawing with, this is all the mud room, this little wing over here. That mud room remains, but we move the door so that you can come in from the side. Um, so we are here for actually according to Krista, three variances. And I'll just, uh, on her comments, which we received um, end of last week, I'm just going to mention the variances and then I'll, and then I'll address them. Uh, it says for building coverage proposed of 12.66%, that has to do with a pergola over a patio that's behind the house over here. Um, we had not indicated that as a variance because uh, I was not familiar with pergolas which do not have a roof. They do not have a cover. They have beams going across above. Um, but anyway, but uh, Chris Anderson is saying that that counts as building coverage. We had counted the chimney. You can see that this chimney is here. It's not in that drawing. There's a little patio that squares off the back of the house. And so we're doing a building, uh, we're doing a pergola and a fireplace above that. Uh, the second variance, as Jude mentioned, is for lot coverage. The lot coverage allowed is 30%. And as Jude mentioned, it's currently 33.6. We are reducing lot coverage to 33.1. Um, the history of that, just real briefly, is that there's a gravel driveway at the front of the property. When uh, in 2008, uh, when I came before this board for, with a prior owner, uh, that did not count um, because of the ordinance at the time where, where gravel was considered to be permeable. Uh, the, the ordinance has since changed, which mean, meant that all of that gravel driveway now becomes counted in lot coverage. So as a part of this project, we tried to find ways by reducing patios in the area around the pool and various other things to reduce the lot coverage a little bit, uh, not only to accommodate this port cashier, which spans over the driveway, but to get it even further towards uh, a half a percent toward compliance. Um, the third one is for the port cashier itself. So um, I wanted to just show you that obviously uh, port cashiers are, are things that exist in many houses in Summit. Um, on this photo board, this is the house next door which has very similar massing and it has a two-story piece on the left. It has a symmetrical large uh, facade in the front and a port cashier uh, over on the far right set back to the side of the house. They, they have um, a separate garage. This house is on the corner of Whitridge and Hobart. Um, this is the port cashier. And as you can see, the driveway goes through, goes under that and that little bit of white in the background is their, uh, is their garage. The next one that I'm showing here is also on Hobart Avenue, one block away at the corner of Springfield Avenue. And again, there's the portico, which is the, the walking uh, entrance. And then there's the port cashier. And you can see the couple cars and the garage all the way in the distance, um, straight back. Uh, and the cars are not parked under the port cashier. They're all the way back, which is the same, same as the case here. These two photos are, show the condition of this house at 120 Hobart Avenue prior to the addition that we added up here. And this is showing that mudroom area over here with the door. Uh, just looking at the second page of this are just some other um, port cashiers. This one is on the corner of Lenox and Prospect Hill Avenue. Again, it's a driveway that goes straight through. There isn't room, none of these are so big that you could park a car there and still get by. They have to, a car would have to move 
so cars are not parked in these port cashiers. So there's one here. This is on Springfield Avenue, just beyond the corner at um, uh, where Hobart intersects. And again, you can see the, the, the porch extends, you drive through, there's the garage. Similarly, this is also on Hobart Avenue, but on the other side of Springfield Avenue, here's the Port Cashier, there's the garage. And this is even the DeBarry Inn, which has a Port Cashier, a little hard to see, but over here, even that has a separate garage. So that all of these are really used just for entrance. Um, Jumping to the staff comments, I won't read this again because uh, Jude already did, but it does talk about how it's very appropriate and very elegant and uh, looks, looks great on, on this house. Um, Jude also mentioned several of these reasons why, the structure, um, why this structure is appropriate for this house. And so I just wanted to repeat a little bit of that, just the architectural part, that it really looks excellent on a house of this age, 120 year old house, a house of this size, it's on over an acre. It's in the zone that can handle the largest houses. It's in the R43 zone where essentially an acre is required and this has um, plenty of space around it, which allows for the Port Cacher to be um, much more than the requirement to the sides, to the front and to the back. Um, and then uh, just to look at the, where it is on the property, I'll just use this one. So this, this is Hobart Avenue. This is that circular drive that I mentioned. It says Stone Drive back to here. There are a bunch of lines in here because we're shifting the driveway to the side a little bit in order to be able to allow enough room for the, uh, this is the Port Cacher and it drives around here and the garage is in the back. So uh, I'll pause for just a moment on the Port Cacher and then I just wanna quickly address some of the other comments that Krista has in her, um, in her comments. Uh, so I don't know, Mrs. Newell, are you running the, um, this one or is Mr. Spur back? Nope, I'm still here and nope. that'll be fine. Thank you. So I'll be glad to answer any questions at this point on the Port Cacher and um, glad to talk about further about how it differs from a carport if anybody has any questions. And then I'll go on to the other. Any sure. questions from the board professionals first? Nope. Any? Sure. Yes. Ed, Ed Snikas. Yes, please. Just some quick questions regarding the poor co-share and your professional opinion. Um, it's set back from the front uh, elevation of the building, isn't it? It's set back yes. and off towards the back portion of the yes. building. That helps to offset its mass along the street. Uh, I think that it would it would have been invisible uh, from the street, except the landscapers got there this week to take out a number of plants before they put back. Um, but the Port Cacher is is not going to be very visible. I think that there are a lot of people who not only drive there, but a lot of dog walkers there. I don't think that it's really going to be very visible. I wish it was, but it's not on the front of the house by the front door, it's off to the side. And as you mentioned, it's set way back. Um, the distance back, um, I had it uh, listed as either, um, the front yard setback is about 120 feet and the rear yard setback is about 82. Okay. Uh, so, we, with regard to the rest of the site plan, there's a number of items listed as proposed. Um, yes. It seems like that's all part and parcel of the lot coverage calculation. Uh, yes, there's some, there are a number of patios which are like the, the area around the pool and um, there's a small patio sort of behind the house that has uh, the grill, those have both been reduced in size in order to uh, get us to a point where we could come in with an application that reduces the lot coverage. Okay. Nothing further, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, let me just see. 
Any question from the public? Okay. Um, Mr. I actually do have, I, I do have one question. There was um, a comment about a generator that is um, far away from the building that it's intended to serve. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me where that is? Yes, I'd be glad to. Um, I'm going to share a screen again, because I have that up. Um, okay, so in 2008, uh, with a prior owner, um, we, we did a, um, we added, we added the generator. It is way over here. That was approved. And in the approval from 2008, it's listed um, in three, <clears throat> three items, uh, page three of eight on that approval. So it's four, uh, section four um, lines H, I, and J, uh, which I'll just read. It mentions that the applicant intends to install a generator, which will be used in the event power goes out in the house. That's H. I says the applicant intends to landscape around the generator so it will not be seen. And J, the generator will be located more than 15 feet from the property line. Um, that was at the time, the requirements for generators were different than they are now. The, the comment that Krista makes is that with the, um, with the evolution of the ordinance, this is required now to be much closer to the house. And so Kristen notes that if we want to leave it here, it should be noted to the, to the board that this is its current location. And if, if, it, if it's not a, a problem for anybody, then it can remain in that location. And in the event that it ever needs to be replaced, um, it could be replaced again in that same location with the same constraints that it not be closer than 15 feet from the property line and that it be well screened. So I think this is similar to the last case where there, there, Chris is suggesting we may want to grant a kind of a preventive variance. So grant a variance now, so that if they want to replace the generator in the future, they don't have to come for a variance then. Am I capturing that correctly, Mr. Ball, do you think? Yep, it's essentially in, in the same boat as what we explained in the last one. Right. And the existing generator is permitted to stay because it was put in, um, and we know when it went in, uh, that in December 2008, the resolution indicates it that uh, those three times. So the current generator can stay, and Chris is just advising that in the event it's ever replaced, either it has to be moved to a conforming location, or if, if the board is able to give an approval for it to remain, um, there's no current plan to replace that anyway. Okay, thank you very much. That it does that answer your? Uh, yeah, question? I was just looking for it and I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's the requirements. People didn't have not as many people had generators back then. Um, then a few storms encouraged a lot of people to get them, and so Summit has uh, expanded on the rules for them. Um, so I just wanted to identify one other thing uh, for this variance and then, um, and then Krista's other quick comment. So we have a pergola, this, this patio is approved and, and has been built. We were planning to add an outdoor fireplace and a pergola on top of that. It's hard to see the pergola really because um, it's, it's sort of squared off in this back corner of the house. The landscaping doesn't, nobody can really see it. Um, Krista mentions that the proposed pergola above the reconfigured patio is 355 square feet or building coverage of 0.77. And she gets a total when she puts that in, she gets a total uh, oops, of 12.66 where 12% is permitted. Um, it is not fully roofed, but I understand she's she's treating it as if it is, but it does not impact uh, stormwater management or anything else. It does not change the silhouette of the house. It is one story high, and it's really just some beams that go across to give a sense of 
a, a sense of that space being a little bit different. Um, and then her, she has a sentence that uh, Andrew Clark helped me understand because I, if you read what her comments, she says the way I had read it, but for the proposed pergola, there would be no building coverage variance required, except that Andrew told me that that's not the way it's intended to be read. It's in, intended to be read, but for the proposed pergola, there would be no building coverage variance required. So she's saying that that because this pergola is here and because it's being counted as if it's solid roof, that's what's causing the building coverage, not the uh, not the pergola. I mean, not the port cashier. Um, and then one last comment that she has, uh, she addresses this circular driveway, which now is permitted because the property is big enough. Uh, this, this, I don't know how old it is. It may be original to the property, but it's certainly been there a very long time and it is now permitted. It was not in 2008. So I will stop share unless anybody needs to see anything else. Thank you. Any, yeah. question, any questions from the board professionals? Not at this time, thank you. Thank you, from the board. Um, oh. Any questions from the public? Let's see. Okay, all right, Mr. Avellino, anything else? Um, that's, that's all we have for you, Ms. Newell. Okay, awesome. Mr. Ball, any conditions? Just our ordinary condition of compliance with the conditions previously noted in the engineer's report. Okay. And for the generator, we just need to just leave that be, correct? Again, assuming the applicant is not looking for a variance for it at this time, we can leave it be. We're not. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, who would like to start deliberation? Liz, did we open it up for public comment? I know oh. asked about yeah. questions. Oh, sorry about that. No, we did not. Any interested comments from the public? Nothing. I see a lot of people on the call, so maybe it's for the next one. <laughs> okay. Think about that. All right. Who would like to get started? Uh, I'll start. Um, it seems like we spent a lot of time discussing problems or issues caused by foreign words. I think if we translate Port Cacher literally from the French, I think it means coach gateway, which I think captures the intent of what it is. It's, it's a gateway for a coach or today cars. So that's really, that's really all it is. And a, and a pergola, you know, I, I wanted to do some more research into this, why that counts as building coverage, because it's clearly, you know, it's got beams going across. It's not really, not nowhere near 100% coverage, probably not even 50% in terms of coverage of the space. So I, I'm not troubled by 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 that either. Um, so I I think it's I think I like I like port cashiers. I like coach gateways. I think they're attractive. They obviously fit in the neighborhood. Um, and I think the other the other issues raised in, in terms of variances are 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 not troublesome. And I think overall it's going to be a very attractive house. It's not a huge change from the street other than port cashier. A lot of work on the inside looks like, but otherwise not much change from the street view. Uh, so I'm inclined to support it. I support it as well. Um, I have gone grocery shopping in crummy weather with toddlers. I can't imagine um, how else you could function without without something like the port co-share. Um, I also note that the house immediately to the right has its driveway on the same, you know, the two driveways are, um, they're not, they don't adjoin, but they're next to each other. So there is plenty of space before you get to the house on the right. So nobody's going to be feeling any of this. Thank you, Claire. Anyone else? I, I would be supportive. And I think that this might be one of those items that we, you know, put down on the list of things that probably have to be um, amended in the DRO to, you know, make specific um, provisions for situations where, 
you know, Portco shares are provided for in the DRO, but I think it looks like a good plan and no reason to say no. Thank you, Diana. Okay, do we have a motion? A motion to approve. I'll second. Awesome, Chris? For um, Mr. Yuko? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Mr. Malay? Yes. Mr. Loikitz? Yes. Mr. Toth? Yes. Mr. Sager? Yes. And Vice Chairwoman Newell? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Avellino, and good luck with the project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Uh, Michelle, do you want to take a quick break? Or are you okay? All right. I'll do whatever the board wants. Okay, we can do a five minute break. So we'll be done and Steve's back. So we'll do a quick break. And uh, we'll come That's back. Uh, end on a high note there, Liz. Give him a break. All right. <laughs> we'll see you in five minutes, everyone. All right, thanks. <laughs> Bart can test his thing. Joe, can you hear me? I can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you're, you're good, Bart. All right, thank you very much. Bart Sheen, do you hear me? I do. Yes, over. Just checking. Good.
Go for how many two families in the um, in the micro uh, neighborhood? Please repeat the question. How many two families in the micro neighborhood uh, around the two lots? Uh, actually, four. We counted four. All right. So you and Mike agree. Yes. All right. Wait on Mr. Wicketts and Mr. Dower to return. And we should be good. Mr. Dower. Hello. And if you're not speaking, we just ask that you'd mute your, your microphone. Thank you. All right, Michelle, you're good? I'm good. Yep. Okay. All right, welcome back. The third application on the agenda this evening is NTL Development LLC 26 and 32 Ashwood Avenue. I believe Mr. Sheehan representing the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Bartholomew A. Sheehan Jr. for the firm of Dempsey Dempsey and Sheehan, attorneys for the applicant NTL development for an application at 26 and 32 Ashwood Road, block 4209, lots 13 and 14. Mr. Chairman, before beginning, may I confirm that my witnesses have logged in? You may. Um, Mr. Ofer Stern? Yes, I'm logged in. Um, Mr. Uh, Michael Lanza Fama? Yes, I'm here. And Mr. Douglas Miller. I'm here. And Mr. Chairman, if I could ask if the chair would inquire as to whether there are any members of the interested public who are expressing an interest in this application so the testimony may, may be directed to their concerns as expressed. I would, I would recognize, I see a number of faces here. If you'd like to just raise your hand or just to acknowledge that you're here um, as a neighbor, as a member of the interested public. Uh, again, there'll be opportunities for you to ask questions of the witnesses, um, as well as to share your opinion of the application in favor uh, or in opposition um, at the appropriate time of the, this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Sheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, once again, this is an application that involves the repurposing of a mason contractor's yard. Uh, the applicant uh, seeks a minor subdivision to create three lots uh, out of the existing combined two lots consisting of 29,013 feet. The purpose of the minor subdivision is to create three lots upon which will be constructed three two-family homes. The applicant uh, does not have the 30,000 square feet required, 10,000 for each lot, but it does have uh, 9,600 plus square feet for each lot, substantially in excess of the average lot area prevailing in the neighborhood. In addition to a lot area variance, 
which is the C variants, C1, C2 variants, the applicant <laughs> seeks approval for three floor area ratio variances uh, to permit the elevation in the attic of approximately 163 minus square, square feet of floor area underneath the principal peak, uh, which is created for aesthetic purposes to blend in with the prevailing architectural use of peaks in the immediate adjoining area. There is a nonconformity with respect to the location of the air conditioning condensers required under the new ordinance to be set back 10 feet from the sideline. Uh, here, the setback is less than 10 feet and therefore requires a variance, but note is taken of the administrative review of Krista Anderson, in which she indicates that the new required 10 foot setback is being the subject of a new amendment to the ordinance, returning <clears throat> the setback requirement to five feet, which would make the proposed condenser setbacks for the three houses conforming. Those are the only variances required. The architecture uh, proposed is consistent with the eclectic architecture in the micro neighborhood uh, between Ashwood Court and the railroad trestle of the railway railroad. Uh, the Ashwood Court on the north uh, on one side of the street and the Oaks Memorial parking lot on the easterly side form the northerly boundary of what I describe as that micro neighborhood and the railroad trestle uh, to the south forms the southerly boundary. Uh, the, there is no attic story and the area occupiable space in the attic is uh, not expanded by reason of the square footage underneath the seven foot uh, vault for the peak and deemed aesthetically necessary to make the project consistent with the neighborhood. I did read the administrative comments of the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, their judgment and sincerity is entitled to a great deal of respect, uh, their enthusiasm for this neighborhood and its preservation in its existing conditions. Uh, condition is not matched by the uh, conditions uh, of the neighborhood in the field. Uh, I have three witnesses, the principal, the civil engineer, the architect, and the civil engineer, Mr. Lanzafama, uh, qualifies as a planner and will reprise his testimony uh, as a planner at the end of the architect's testimony. If there are any questions from the board or members of the interested public at this time, I would be happy to attempt to answer them. If not, I would call the first witness in this matter. Pause for just a moment. This is questions uh, for Mr. Sheehan, if you if you'd like. Uh, otherwise, we'll proceed to uh, the expert, the witnesses for this application. I see Risa Gorlick. Do have a question for Mr. Sheehan? Can unmute. I would ask you just uh, state your name and your address as well, for the record. Okay, so uh, Risa Gorlick and Randolph Alam, Nine Russell Place. Yeah. So so. A question regarding the height. Um, 
what what is the excess of the current you know, zoning restriction uh, that you were seeking? None. You just said that you were, you know, it's a three story, right? So what is the... No, it is a two and a half story with a peaked roof. That's all. Like every other house uh, in the area. Okay. No height, no height variance at all. So, 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 so what's the variance associated with that? You, you brought that up as your initial comment. You know, the, the floor area ratio variance is created by the space in the attic that is over seven feet in height. Uh, How over? It's 1.63% at the max. It's 163 square feet. It's not a height variance, ma'am. It's a floor area ratio variance. It's a, if you want to put more houses there than, than the lot is, is big enough for. We'll ask that you, sorry, Ms. Skorlick, we're just asking that you, we hold your comments on the application until like the close. We're just asking questions at this point. So, so what you're saying is that the, the, it's the floor, it, it's the floor to lot ratio or kind of the, whatever you would call that, that yes. impacts. Right. The floor area ratio variance of 1.63%. Okay. 35% so, 35 is permitted 36.63 in one of the houses is the maximum permitted, is the maximum proposed. Okay, so, so essentially what you're saying is that, you know, these were two single family dwellings um, it's an extra lot. Yeah. Uh, so we're essentially increasing the density from, uh, I, I, I know the woman who used to live in one of them, you know, and I knew the guy who, who, Rented. who, uh, built the fence and knocked it down. So we, we're, we're essentially going from a ratio of two people, two people to to, Who knows to, to how six many, families, right? To six families, so you know it's a pretty significant increase in density. It, it, okay. Sorry, again, we're gonna any questions? Well, well, are, well, are, no, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that you know this neighborhood is yeah. Pretty, so we're not accepting testimony at this point. We're just accepting questions of Mr. Sheehan and Mr. Sheehan. Okay. If you feel there okay. be a witness you're presenting that can address some of these architectural issues. And okay, perhaps. so so here's my question. Here's my question. There is no question being asked. Let's move on. No, I'm going to ask a question. Please. So so why do we? Why does our community need to have a higher density of housing in this particular micro neighborhood? I'm just asking. I'm waiting. There Mr. Sheehan, is, you're there, welcome to answer if you'd like. Yeah, there, there is no substantial increase in density. You have yeah, two, two 14,000 square foot lots. The lot area required is 5,000 square feet for a single family home, 10,000 square feet for two families. He's proposing two, three lots. No, I understand what you're, what you're saying. I mean, technically, yeah, right. But I'm just, I'm just, you know, asking the general question. I mean, I, I perceive that um, there's not a lot of love for our community. So um, I'll just, our micro community. So I'm just going to uh, put this out there, you know, why do we need more density? We have enough density. I, I, this thank, has thank to stop. Your, Mr. This has to stop. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you. All right, Mr. Mr. Steiner, Mr. Yuko, thank you. So again, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that this is uh, something that the, that the, right. uh, would you please mute him? Uh, I think it's time that he understands that the issues here are then that this organization is not here to pass zoning. It is up here to pass exemptions to the zoning. If he wants to change things in the zoning ordinance, he needs to go to city council. No, I, all I'm saying is- I, No, you're I, done, sir. 
Sorry, I, I say, I, Mr. I, yeah, sorry. Just to I, just I, to I, clarify I, from a process I, perspective, and and then we appreciate your interest, and we'll provide you with additional opportunities to ask questions and certainly to provide comment at the end. Okay. But we want well, to allow Mr. Sheehan, Mr. Sheehan's witnesses, okay. the board's experts, to give you the opportunity to learn more about this application and to ask questions at an appropriate time with what we hope will be a more informed perspective on the application well before the board does cast its votes. Um, so if we can, we'll proceed now, um, Mr. Sheehan, to actually, your first witness. Actually, I had a question. Ah, Ms. Hope. <laughs> All right, I listen, I, I follow you. What do you got? Um, and and it's, one, it's one Mr. Sheehan has heard before, just reading this, is there, as part of this application, is there going to be any required set aside for affordable housing? There is no affordable housing set aside, just the payment of the fee. Okay. And now, because it's the three lots, two different. Yeah, Ms. Toth, as you may recall lots. from the last yeah. application, we dealt with this as two family homes. They're not bound by the requirement to okay. uh, provide affordable housing units. Okay. I'm a slow learner. I'll get it. I also have a question. Uh, it's regarding the uh, building uh, number 32. What's the status of it? Is it going to be de demolished or uh, uh, what are the uh, actual current conditions? It will be demolished, Mr. Malay. Thank you. I, I have a question and it's really a follow up to the affordable housing um, uh, fund is the reason why there's no obligation to make a donation into the affordable housing fund is because there's going to be a subdivision into three separate lots. Is that correct, Mr. Ball? The way the affordable housing is the set aside requirement works. The set aside, yes. You have multifamily and that's defined as uh, you know, three or more units. And here we have two family units. It doesn't trigger that set aside requirement as provided in the ordinances. But it is also, a there's actually six units here, but it's just the fact that they're putting only two units on each of three separate lots. As yeah. part of this project, aren't we dividing two lots into three? Yes. And is that being, is that approval happening by our board or is that happening at a different level? Yes, it would be with the board. It is a subdivision request, right? right. That's yes. Part of this, this application, the requested changes. Minor subdivision. If I can offer uh, another assistance with that. Sure. Um, with regard to the development fee, there may be a development fee paid by this developer not necessarily an affordable unit. So Correct. there may be contributions to the trust fund, which will be used elsewhere to build affordable housing or finance affordable housing. And that could, and that could end up with affordable housing? Yes, somewhere else, yes, as a result of using that trust fund money. Well, is that a question or a de definitive item that will happen? That's a probably, it's a most likely a definitive item because it goes by the assessed value. And there's an increase in the assessed value, so therefore there's a fee that's paid. Okay, off to a slow start here, but uh, Mr. Sheehan, if you'd like to proceed with your first uh, witness, and again, we invite the board, uh, the, our expert witnesses and the public to ask questions. Um, at the conclusion of the witnesses, the members of the interested public will have the opportunity to offer your opinion in favor or in opposition without interruption, but again, only questions uh, during our proceedings through these witnesses. Thank you. I would ask that the testimony, Mr. Chairman, of Ofer Stern be given in this matter. Yes, and that he be admitted to the platform to be sworn for that purpose. Is he being yes. presented as an expert witness, uh, Mr. Sheehan? No, he's a, a witness uh, on behalf of the uh, principal. Okay. Mr. Stern, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And please state your name, spell your last name for the record. Ofer Stern, S-T-E-R-N. Thank you. Counsel, your witness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ball. Mr. Stern, are you the um, 
Principal uh, Director of NTL Development? Yes, I am. Uh, what is your occupation? Developer builder. And how long have you been in that uh, field? About 33 years. And where have your developments been located principally? Uh, Livingstone, Milburn, Showtill, Summit. Uh, what is the most recent project in Summit that you have done? Uh, two years ago, uh, 117 Canoebrook Parkway. And are you the current owner of number 26 and number 32 Ashwood Avenue? Yes, I am. Can you describe the existing conditions of those two lots, beginning with lot 26 first? Yes, so just to correct the facts, lot 26 had a two family house, not a single family house to answer the previous uh, question. So it was a two family about a hundred years old, basically falling apart, steam heat, boiler, low basement, I would say some unsafe conditions, terrible layout. It was maybe one time a one family, one time a two family. It was changed for, for some times. And there was also a detached two car garage in the back. Now, Mr. Stern, could you tell the board and the members of the interested public, what is located uh, to the north of lot number 26, uh, Ashwood Ave uh, uh, Avenue? It's a parking lot that belonged to the Oaks. It's the Oaks Memorial Chapel? Yes, yes, sir, a parking lot. How about lot number 30, uh, how about number 32, lot 14? Can you describe the existing conditions of, of that house? Yes, um, a single family house, uh, which is, was also um, a house for a family that lived there for a long time. And the son had a mason storage yard in the back that had uh, two or three sheds that he stored his tools. He had a, a big truck, a tractor, uh, a backhoe, and some mason equipment in the back. Uh, the house is about four feet from the property line on its left side. And uh, what, is there a house next to it, uh, to the south, Mr. Stern? Yes, there is a, a two family house right next to me, which is about three feet from the property line. Um, fair to, yes. So is it fair to say that there's approximately seven feet between the two structures? Yes. And yes. how about the condition of the house at number 32? 32, uh, 32 was in a livable condition. Um, you can see that it was built in two parts. The original part, which was a three bedroom, one bath upstairs. And since the owner was a Mason, he did an addition later on of a family room built out of brick. So you can see the addition family room in the back and he increased the size of the kitchen. So it was in a livable condition. Uh, how about the heating uh, uh, base for yes, lot 34, still, we're 32? Still dealing, 32, we're still dealing with steam heat, no air condition, window units. Uh, now, you, you've mentioned the unusual feature between 32 and 34 with the sidelines uh, being four feet on lot 32 and three feet on lot 34. Uh, both of those sidelines are currently non-conforming. Is that correct? Yes. Are there other two family uh, houses in adjacency on Ashwood Road, Ashwood Avenue between Ashwood Court and the railroad trestle? Yes. Um... My latest visit today, just to confirm, we have four two-family houses uh, within the immediate neighborhood, which is the bridge of the railroad tracks, 
to Ashwood Court. There is four two families. And one is immediately adjacent to you to the south, correct? Yes. What is it that you propose, Mr. Stern? I propose a new three family houses. And when I gave the job to the architect, we were trying to develop and plan uh, new houses that consist with and complementary of the prevailing peak roofs in the immediate area. So, so when you say you, you, I think you said you were going to have three family homes. Uh, is it three two family homes that you propose? Yes, three two family homes. And will the two family home to exist? on lot 32 uh, and the conform in its side yard as required in its adjacency to lot 34, to number 34? Yes, it will even more than what required by law. Did you retain experts to assist you with this project? Yes, I hired uh, Casey and Keller engineers from Milliburn Main Street. And how about an architect? I hired AHM architects from Milburn on Main Street also. And is the architect providing services for that firm named Douglas Miller? Yes, he's. All right, now, um, Mr. Stern, with reference to the administrative review of Krista Anderson, she pointed out that the driveway width of 20 feet was excessive and it indicated that it would be favorably reviewed if that driveway could be limited to 18 feet. Is that a condition that you would accept? Yes, I will. Now, Mr. Stern, I direct your attention to the comments by the forester with respect to street front trees with respect to foundation planting and with respect to privacy planting in the rear yard. Uh, and I ask you whether or not you would agree to choose a street frontage tree selection that would be approved by the city forester. Yes, I will. Would you agree to propose foundation landscaping that would be acceptable and subject to the city forester's review? Yes, I will. Now, with respect to the comment of the forester related to rear yard natural cover screening, what is your response to that suggestion? Um, I will also, I will follow his instruction. With it, I will fence on the property line each lot. And if the fence is inadequate, will you supplement it with planting? Sure, I will. Right now, I'm going to ask Mr. Nicola if he could uh, introduce uh, exhibit A1 uh, and share the screen with that while I ask Mr. Uh, Stern whether or not he asked the architect to prepare a photo exhibit that demonstrates what the project will look like when completed. Now just wait Mr. Stern until there you go. This is, has been introduced, this photo montage has been introduced as A1 in these proceedings. And I ask whether or not that is a, a representation of the photo montage that you commissioned the architect to prepare. Yes, it is. Right, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions of this witness and would submit him to the examination of the board and members of the interested public.
Before we do accept questions, uh, Mr. Sheehan, uh, would you accept the condition for this application, um, the submission of a landscaping plan subject to the review and approval of Mr. Linson to capture, yes. capture all those requests? Yes, sir. Okay, Andy, thank you. All right, so we'll open first to questions uh, from our board professionals, Mr. Dower, Mr. Snickis, any questions here um, of the applicant's representative? Mr. Chairman, I'll hold off till the uh, engineer's testimony, if, you, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Mr. Schneckis, anything for this uh, witness? Mr. Chairman, not at this time. Okay. Any questions from members of the board for this witness? All right, seeing no questions from members of the board. Any questions of this witness uh, for members of the public? And again, this is just questions, no commentary, uh, just questions for this witness. I have a question. Okay, can you hop on uh, video for us real quick? And uh, state your name as well as address for the record and then your, your question. Good evening, uh, my name is Edward Margulis and I reside at 11 Russell Place um, in the Ashwood property in question connects to the rear of my property. And I noticed that the, the back of the Ashwood property is sloped toward the property, my property in 13 Russell Place. So my concern is in regards to runoff towards 11 and 13 Russell from the proposed improvements, which was also, I believe, noted in Mr. Dower's uh, memo dated March 17, 2021. Uh, will the property be graded to ensure no runoff? That's my question. A, a good question, Mr. Chairman, and I think it's more appropriately answered by the engineer. Okay, Mr. Margola, so we'll just, we'll hold that for the engineer. I'll do my best to weave it into our questions if uh, we don't hear an appropriate response. And you're of course welcome <laughs> as well at that point to ask your question again. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions for this witness, knowing that there is further testimony still to be provided by the application, through the application? Uh, yes, I see Blake Scallett, at least Blake's uh, computer perhaps. Uh, yes, my name is Linda <laughs> Walker. I live at 15 Russell Place and I have lived at this location for 49 and a half years and backed up to the properties that are being mentioned. I'd like to ask the owner um, the time frame in which the two properties were purchased. They were not purchased at the same time. And if he had only been able to purchase one lot, what would he have put on that lot? Um, I think that Mr. Stern can answer the question with regard to when he purchased the lots. Uh, the application currently seeks to develop these two lots with a proposed minor subdivision and a speculation as to what might be put on the lot in the event that he did not own the two lots. It's not something that is relevant in these proceedings. But with regard to the dates of purchase, I would invite Mr. Stern to respond to the extent that he can. I would also just note, I do agree with council that getting into the hypothetical or speculation about possible projects isn't something that's uh, relevant to the board and isn't something that should be considered here. Well, the part of the issue is that the one lot that was first purchased Ma'am, I think the we're housing. probably getting into commentary at this point. So, I mean, we have the application in front of us, but you're certainly welcome to suggest comments at the end of the application when we're accepting public uh, submissions. Mr. Stern, would you like to Thank answer you. the question about uh, the purchase dates on the property? Otherwise, uh, we'll see if there's any other questions. Uh, number 30, uh, number 32. I approached the lady. The first lot was for sale. It was a faster sale. The second purchase was Miss Rosie. Um, I forgot the last name, but this was negotiation and also Corona got in the middle and she got sick. Everything got delayed and there's uh, some time in between. Okay, any other questions for this witness, Mr. Stern, for members of the public? Again, just questions and, and you'll have the ability to provide your opinion of this application at the close. Mr. Olin, did you wanna jump in again? Question? 
Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, just, I, I was wondering whether Mr. Stern could get more specific about the dates. That wasn't very specific. It was a legitimate question and it was an evasive response. More specific. It was, look it was his response. Mr. Stern, uh, uh, do you have a date on which the uh, property at uh, 32 was closed? Uh, 32 was closed on July uh, Ju let's say July 1st uh, of last year. 2020. 2020. And when was 26 purchased and closed? Uh, maybe um, to the best year, of your recollection. A year before. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Any other questions for this witness? Otherwise, we'll press on with some further expert testimony. I don't see any other hands raised. Mr. Sheehan, would you care to introduce your next witness? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that the testimony of Michael Lanzafama be given in this matter to testify in the field of civil engineering. And if you could. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank My you. name is Michael Lanzafama. That's L-A-N-Z-A-F-A-M-A. -A -A. I'm a licensed professional engineer, land surveyor, and planner, licensed in the state of New Jersey. I'm a principal with the firm of Casey and Keller Incorporated, 258 Main Street, Milburn, New Jersey. I've been licensed as a professional engineer and land surveyor since 1984 and as a professional planner since 1985. I've testified before this board and the planning board uh, in summit on numerous occasions. Would submit the witness to voir dire, Mr. Ball. I have no questions. Any other questions for members of the board? Otherwise, I imagine we're inclined to accept his credentials. Welcome back, Mr. Lanzafama. We will accept your credentials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lanzafama, why don't you take us through the subdivision first? Uh, and as you approach the subdivision, uh, describe existing conditions of the lots in question and the immediate adjoining neighborhood. Very good. Uh, I'm going to share my screen at the moment, and what I'm going to do is indicate to you utilizing, this is the cover sheet um, on the plan set, um, and what I'm going to do is utilize the aerial mapping on the left-hand side of the cover sheet to help describe the neighborhood, the property, and its location, and the relative street access. Um, as Sam pointed out, we're dealing with uh, 2632 Ashwood Avenue, tax lots 13 and 14 in block 4209, and that's the area outlined in yellow uh, on the exhibit. Uh, it is uh, located on the easterly side of Ashwood Avenue, which runs across the upper portion of the sheet. Um, Ashwood Court is immediately perpendicular opposite the property. Uh, to the north is Morris Avenue, uh, the train trestle to the south. Um, the property is approximately 263 feet south of the intersection with Morris Avenue. As you can see from the exhibit, um, there's the parking area for the Oak Center as uh, previously uh, stated by uh, Mr. Stern. And you can see uh, the area is a grouping of two family and single family homes. Uh, it's an established residential uh, neighborhood uh, with an eclectic uh, group of architecture. Um, going to the tax maps, uh, which uh, is also part of that cover sheet. Um, you can see uh, the varied sizes of the lots, but the predominant size, especially immediately across uh, Ashwood Avenue are uh, 5,000, 5,500 uh, square foot lots. Um, as part of the development, we prepared a title and topographic survey of the property 
indicating the existing conditions uh, that are on the site. And as Mr. Stern pointed out, the uh, remaining single family home is immediately adjacent within four feet of the southern boundary. There are outbuildings, a large frame shed, two car garage, which are also about four feet or less uh, from the property line. There's access to the garage area and that building is via a driveway uh, off of Ashwood Avenue. Um, the topography of the site is such that a high knoll exists in the northeast corner. Uh, the property slopes slightly to the east, but the majority of the property slopes south and west towards Ashwood Avenue. Um, all the utilities uh, for the potential development are readily available within Ashwood Avenue. There's sanitary sewer, gas, water, overhead electric, telephone and cable, uh, as well as available storm sewer uh, to service the subject site. The proposal is to take the overall lot, which there are actually two 89 foot wide by 163 foot deep lots, totaling over, just over 29,000 square feet and, su and subdivide them relatively equally into three lots, each having a frontage of approximately 39.33 feet. Uh, the lots moving from south to north, lot, proposed lot 1301 would have a lot area of 9,669 square feet. Lot 1401 would have a lot area of 9,671 square feet and proposed lot 15.01 would have a lot area of 9,673 square feet. The property is located in the R5 zone, which requires single family residential homes to have a minimum lot area of 5,000 square feet and two family residential homes to have a minimum lot area of 10,000 square feet. Um, so as a result, we are seeking a variance for undersized lots, uh, lot 1301, uh, the variance requested is 331 square feet. For lot 14.01, it's 329 square feet. And for lot 15.01, it's 327 square feet. Um, as you are aware, and as indicated in uh, your planner's report, um, and uh, Krista Anderson also mentioned it, is that we have a requirement to meet section 35-14.6.I1, which requires an analysis of the neighborhood. And the neighborhood, um, according to the ordinance, is defined as the three lots immediately to the south, the three lots immediately to the north, and the three lots immediately across the street, facing on the same street. And that analysis uh, was performed uh, by my office, by myself. And what you see on the screen now is a summary of those lots. And what we've taken is the lot area of each of the lots, 40 Ashwood Avenue being 8,073 square feet, 36 Ashwood Avenue, 9,780 square feet, and 34 Ashwood Avenue, 6,527 square feet. So these are the three lots immediately to the south. To the north is 22 Ashwood Avenue, which is actually the parking lot for um, uh, the Oak Center. And that's 14,717 square feet and 18 Ashwood Avenue is 5,258 square feet. We did not include 126 Morris Avenue in the analysis because as its street address indicates, it fronts on another street and therefore is not counted in this analysis. Immediately across Ashwood Avenue, it's 27 Ashwood Avenue, which is 5,000 square feet. 29 is 5,000 and 31 Ashwood Avenue is 5,500. This gives us a neighborhood average of 7,482 roughly square feet. 
Um, so the lot areas that we are proposing are consistent with the character of the lots within the area. Um, the lot width, a similar analysis was done and we determined that that uh, lot width or lot frontage is 57.66 is the average and we're proposing 59.33. I would like to point out that there's a typo on my um, zoning table. Um, the zoning table that is in the upper left hand corner indicates that the proposed lot widths are 53. That is not correct. They are in fact 59.33 indicated on the map itself. It was a typographical error, and I apologize for the, any confusion that they have caused. Um, so you can see from uh, what we are doing on the plan, the neighborhood analysis that we had proposed, that we are consistent with the character of the neighborhood. The houses as proposed are fully compliant with all other aspects of the zoning ordinance other than the FAR, as Mr. Sheehan pointed out. We're compliant as to building coverage, we're compliant as to side yard setback, front yard setback, rear yard setback. We're compliant as to height, um, so um, and building coverage as well, and total lot coverage. So all of the metrics that define the intensity of use of a property are in keeping with the zoning. As a matter of fact, um, if you look at some of the numbers uh, that we are proposing, for example, um, the minimum front yard setback required based upon the average setback calculation is 25 feet. We're proposing 34 feet, a greater setback. The side yard minimum is seven. We're over 10 feet in every aspect. Um, the combined side yard has to be 33%. We're at 37.7% across the board. Our rear yard setback requirement is 30 feet. In every case, we're either 77 feet or very close to it, uh, more than twice what is required uh, by the zoning. Um, Mr. Mr. Lodzafala, may I stop you for a second there? Sure. Um, with regard to the last metric that you testified to, I'm going to ask you if you would reaffirm the representation that you made with regard to the proposed rear yard setbacks of the proposed three two family houses, because those rear yards back into the rear yards of the houses on Russell Place that have been the subject of comment and questions earlier this evening. Yes, as I stated, and I will reiterate, the required setback is 30 feet. What we're proposing is 77 feet in every instance. So we're more than twice what is uh, required uh, by zoning. Um, All right. W w one more uh, interruption in your uh, presentation. I'm going to ask you to advert to Krista Anderson's review where she speaks of the location of the air conditioning condensers uh, on the second page of her administrative review and indicate where on the document, the plan three uh, that you are referring to, those air conditioning units are displayed? The air conditioning units, there'd be two for each, uh, each house, uh, each uh, uh, apartment section. Um, those will be set back six feet from the side property line. They'll be located in the, in the side yard. So they're six feet on every occasion. There'll be two for each unit. Um, as Krista points out in her memo that um, when we were developing uh, this plan, the requirement was five feet. By the time we got it submitted, it had changed to 10. And she advises us that um, there's been some uh, issues with regard to that 
additional setback requirement on a number of uh, single family homes and applications. And as a result, the ordinance is being revised back to the five feet. So by time we come in for a building permit, most likely the requirement would be five feet and, and not the 10 feet. So we would be compliant. But at, at the present time, the uh, plan as presented presents a four foot nonconformity in the location of the air conditioning units, correct? That is correct, Mr. Shannon. All right, please continue. Thank you. So back to the zoning table and the metrics. Um, the 20% lock coverage, we are uh, at the maximum permitted by code, but the total lot coverage, 45% is permitted. Uh, we're just over 30% at 30.3%. Uh, it's the FAR uh, that we are exceeding what is permitted by code. It's 35% um, for lot 13.01. We're at 36.63% or 3,542 square feet, uh, which uh, exceeds uh, the allowable uh, lot coverage, or excuse me, uh, FAR by 158 square feet. Uh, lot 14.01 is at 36.41% or 3,522 square feet, which is a variance of 137 square feet. And finally, lot 15.01 is at 36.61%. That's 3,542 square feet, requesting a variance of 157 square feet. So as you can see, um, the, the, uh, uh, the amount of shortage in the lot area and the amount of excess in the FAR is relatively small and in my mind is de minimis and can be easily accommodated uh, by the lots in question. Um, in response to, excuse me, let me back this out. Um, in response to some of the other memos we received um, from engineering, um, each lot would be required to prepare a lot grading plan um, in which um, stormwater management measures would be employed on each lot. We would install a dry well, which would then connect out uh, any overflow from the dry well, would connect out to the storm sewer that exists in Ashwood Avenue. Um, any area that pitches towards the back would either be naturally landscaped and be no different than it is today, or we'll redirect it in some way to try and, and force it back uh, to the west so that it doesn't impact negatively uh, the owners of tax lot three or tax lot four. Um, the overall site itself, um, you're only looking at uh, a relatively small increase in impervious coverage. A, uh, the existing condition is 6,222 square feet. The proposed condition would be 8,790 square feet. So you're, you're only looking at um, an increase of, of roughly 2,600 square feet. Um, we will be modifying the driveways so that make them a little more narrow, 18 feet wide, but then they will go straight out as now permitted by the current uh, DRO. Um, as the landscaping elements, we took note of Mr. Linson's comments. I reviewed it with my landscape architect. Um, he saw no reason why we couldn't either come up with an alternate solution for the trees we chose uh, along the streetscape. One option he thought might be possible if we wanted to stick with the larger trees that we had proposed, perhaps they get moved to the right-of-way line rather than on the curb side, which gives them a more uh, a larger growth belt, uh, as uh, Mr. Linson had pointed out. But we'll be happy to review that with him. We will provide a detailed landscaping plan for each of the sites, along with a detailed grading, drainage, and soil erosion control plan. Uh, as part of our the approval process, we will be submitting to the Somerset Union Soil Conservation District for certification as to uh, soil erosion <clears throat> and to the building department and to the engineering department for 
uh, lock grading plans and approvals. Um, from the engineering perspective, um, I think that's all I have. When I come back with my planner's hat on, I think we'll get into a little more details about the positive and negative criteria uh, of the application and why we feel that the granting of the variance would not have a substantial impact on the neighborhood or the intent and purpose of your zoning ordinance or master plan. Now, Mr. Lazafama, recognizing the distinction between your uh, civil engineering testimony and your planning testimony, I ask as a foundation for comments to be made in the testimony of the architect, whether or not you created a photo array of the adjacent area so that we can have a basis for the architect's testimony in regard to complementarity. I did. Uh, let me just bring that up on the screen. Um, this is a, a photo exhibit that I prepared today, as a matter of fact. Um, and what this gives you is uh, a representation of the character of the architecture that exists along the street. Um, this is a photo board prepared by myself. The photographs were taken by myself um, today and uh, for the purpose of helping the board uh, better understand the eclectic nature of the architecture that exists here along Ashwood Avenue. Um, the center photo that's marked photograph number two is a photograph of the subject property, which is 32 Ashwood Avenue. And immediately adjacent to it is the two family house at 34 Ashwood Avenue. And you could see the relatively close proximity of the two structures, one to the other. This is what Mr. Sheehan and uh, Mr. Stern were alluding to in their earlier uh, testimony and descriptions of the site. Um, to my left is photograph number one. This is 18 Ashwood Avenue, uh, a typical split level type house you might see in, in many developments built in the 70s and 80s. And you can see the front loaded garage. Uh, this is immediately to the north of the parking lot for uh, Oak Center. Uh, to my right is um, 36 Ashwood Avenue. Uh, this is a single family home uh, immediately adjacent to 30, 34. And you can see the uh, garage set back uh, facing the street. On the bottom of the sheet, uh, photograph number four is, uh, the photograph is taken from the front of our property, looking across Ashwood Avenue uh, to the southwest. The street you see here is Ashwood Court. This too is a two family house uh, located at 27 uh, Ashwood Avenue. Immediately adjacent to that is 29 Ashwood Avenue. Again, you could see the peaked roofs that we were trying to emulate uh, in our design. Um, Immediately adjacent further to the south is 31 Ashwood Avenue. Uh, again, a typical uh, colonial style home with the front facing garage, two car garage, uh, as you can see. Um, move towards the south, you can see the trestle off in the distance. This is uh, 35 and 39 Ashwood. Uh, 39 is also a two family house, uh, but again, you could see the varied uh, architecture that exists uh, along the streetscape. So, uh, Mr. Lazafama, why don't we stop there and we'll pick up on your characterization of the neighborhood uh, as being uh, eclectic with predominance uh, of peaked architectural treatment of roofs and a multiple variety of garage treatments as you come back wearing your planning uh, hat uh, after the architect testifies. And at this time, I would submit Mr. Lanzafama for questions regarding his civil engineering testimony by members of the board the board experts 
and members of the interested public, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Sheen again is requesting uh, us first to uh, view Mr. Lanzafama's testimony uh, through the engineering lens. Oh, my. So any questions, uh, Mr. Dower, you wanna kick us off? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, so the, the application, as we mentioned before, as Mr. Lanzafama pointed out, is for a subdivision. The engineering plans will be reviewed uh, by the city for grading permits. One of the things he mentioned uh, that I just wanted to um, recommend something uh, in addition to that was the, the existing lot coverage as compared to what's proposed. Uh, because these are three new lots being created and because they're three new structures, I would recommend that the uh, dry wells or the stormwater systems be designed to uh, accommodate the runoff the stormwater from each one of those uh, structures on their individual sites so that we, there would be no, in a sense, credit for what's existing uh, out there now or what was existing. Uh, that would be probably the, the major um, change or recommendation that I would have. Uh, he did mention about the screening. I think uh, somewhere we talked about screening and a, developing a landscaping plan. Um, and the drainage comment is uh, partly due to the concern from some of the neighbors. Uh, the property is relatively flat. Um, and uh, there is a big distance between their proposed distance between the rear property line and the home so that there is a lot of leeway. But I would recommend that, um, as I said, that the, if not already planning to do that, that the new grading permits for each one of the homes uh, accommodate the drainage of stormwater from each, each individual lot. Yeah. And that so would be, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that, that would be it. Okay. That, that was our intent was to look at each lot individually um, I was just trying to point out that there wasn't a significant and impervious coverage, uh, 2,600 square feet, but we were intending to size uh, the dry wells for each of the homes separately as if it was new construction. Okay. That's, uh, pr that's pretty much the extent of my comments. Thank you. And just to, uh, Mr. To Chairman, Mr. Yes, Chairman yeah. uh, with regard to Mr. Doar's uh, questioning and his administrative report, I neglected to indicate that all of the comments not specifically discussed by Mr. Doerr and Mr. Lanzafama as specified in the engineering review would be carried as conditions of approval. Okay, thank you. And the only other thing, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, what we've been doing lately with the board is uh, recommending retaining uh, drainage or stormwater jurisdiction for two years. I would recommend that as well. That's acceptable. Okay, and, and just with back to, to totally close this point in stormwater management, um, I, I wanna make sure that uh, we've captured, would it be appropriate as a condition? I'm kind of looking both to Andy uh, and to Chris as a condition that a, a stormwater management plan be submitted for your review and approval, Mr. Dower, how should we phrase this? Well, that normally goes to the, to the city, to the city engineering staff. So okay. I would defer to them Nor normally when there's no issues with, um, they shouldn't need to come back to the board. They're saying they're going to be compliant with everything. So it really would be done internally, but um, they, if they needed any assistance, I would help them out. Okay. My only comment would be, you, you may, Chris, you may want to put in the fact that we agreed to size the dry wells for each lot individually existing coverage. So when she reviews that, she knows that. Okay, no, nope, this is helpful for the preparation of the resolution, Andy. You know, this, I think this level of detail to incorporate, to call out. So uh, we can work on that. Um, any questions, Mr. Snickis? I don't know if you have anything for the engineering testimony. We'll get to the planning testimony next. Yes, I was uh, going to hold off any planning questions for the uh, testimony after the architect. Um, but just some questions regarding a few items with uh, regard to tree preservation. Are there intentions to save trees uh, towards the rear of the property? Uh, yes, any, any trees that are in good condition, uh, we would save the, um, uh, I, I believe some of the cedars that are towards the back of the lot are not in great shape. Um, the intention uh, as indicated on the, uh, on the subdivision plat was primarily uh, to take down the tree, the street trees, 
because they were in pretty poor condition, as well as some of the evergreens along the front. Um, but uh, our landscape architect will meet with John on the site, John Linson on the site. And uh, if, if it's appropriate, we'll take the trees down only to help supplement and improve the evergreen screen that we are proposing to plant. Okay, so any removal will be coordinated with Mr. Winston. Correct, we'll, we'll, we'll secure any tree removal permit that's required. Okay, we heard the applicant indicate that he's gonna be adding fencing around the property. I presume all the fencing will be in compliance with the DRO regulations? Yes, it would be. Fencing, okay. And it's intended to be solid fencing? Is that your understanding? Um, I don't know if it's gonna be a board on board style fence or a PVC solid fence, that decision hasn't been made yet, but it would be ordinance compliant. Okay. Um, with regard to the air, air conditioning condensers, um, and this is in relation to the southerly portion of the property, is there the ability to move the AC condensers, and maybe this is a question for the architect, that's adjacent to lot 12, that's directly adjacent to the last building, it seems to be close to, if not right, next to the existing home on that property. And it's been noted earlier that that existing home doesn't comply with the side yard setbacks. Is there ability to move it to the back of the building? Um, we, could, we could slide it straight back. Um, there's a little bump out on the architecture. We could slide it straight back and nestle in there. That'll put it behind the house mm -hmm. um, and probably have less impact. It's just food for thought. Thank you, nothing further. Sure. Mm -hmm. Questions from members of the board. Uh, this is again, related principally to engineering testimony while planning testimony next. I'm not sure if this is more of more engineering or if it would be more planning, but um, I, with respect to the size of the garage, the width of the driveway and how many cars might be expected to be parked and living in four bedroom houses? Would that be more planning or engineering? Well, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> so, I think so. Um, each house is equipped with a one car garage uh, that's 10 feet wide by 20 feet deep. Um, I, read, I read somewhere that it's they're only nine feet wide. No, they're, they're 10 according to my understanding, the architect will testify next and will clarify any confusion that there might be there. Um, but we're proposing to make the driveways 18 feet wide as, as allowed by the ordinance. So typically you're gonna have a car in the garage and a car in front of the garage, like many other single family homes or two family homes you see uh, in the area. Um, so the, the driveways are set back uh, 34 feet from the right of way, which puts them about 44 feet from the traveled way. So there's adequate room for them to park in front of the garage and still walk around the vehicles and, and not have them right on the sidewalk. There's, there's plenty of room there. And that's the requirement for uh, under the uh, RSIS, Residential Site Improvement Standards, the requirement is to have two parking spaces per dwelling unit. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for uh, with respect to engineering testimony? I guess as long as, uh, if I may, Steve. Go ahead, please. Uh, the, um, I would probably be a whole lot more comfortable with this after May 7th or May 5th, whatever date you guys are meeting, but uh, has anybody looked at the current projects that have been approved along Ashwood Court that under our current resolutions, which I know you may or may not change based on the plans that I have seen that will uh, come to you on the 7th. But today, uh, if things were built as approved, you'd have 13 units coming out Ashwood Court onto Ashwood uh, Road. Uh, and, uh, you know, has anybody looked at the traffic issue uh, that that could cause. Now, you guys may change it. You may, you know, I've been recused from this thing for six months, but there, there may be things that you, you know that, uh, that I don't,
but uh, if things go the way they currently were left at the last resolution of this board, you've got a lot of traffic on that street you're adding, and now you're adding another, uh, another bunch of units. How are we handling that? I, I think that I personally am not aware of what's transpiring on Ashwood Court, but uh, I think that your council will advise that off street traffic not created by the application itself is not something that is cognizable in the deliberations over whether or not the relief sought and the proposal offered in the uh, pending application is reasonable under the statute. Andy, would you care to add anything? Uh, this is with respect to the pending uh, Italian American Club Habitat case, I believe that Mr. Stein is referring to. Right, no, and I mean, Bart accurately summarized it right there. Um, you know, if the particular application was adding a ton of traffic, which would present an issue, that could be the case, but really a pending application that isn't finalized yet um, isn't necessarily some, especially when it's offsite, although it may affect the surrounding area, isn't something that should be considered here. I would strongly disagree with you on that. Uh, and I can tell you, I can't vote for this application in that circumstance. Mr. Lanza, Mr. Sheehan or Mr. Lanza Fonza, is there any further testimony or perspective you'd like to provide on tr for traffic impact as it relates to this particular application? Well, the, perhaps the to ameliorate I, Mr. Steiner's concerns? <laughs> the only thing I would like to point out is that these are permitted uses in the zone. They're, um, they're anticipated for one or two family homes. Um, there's an existing single family home on the one lot. And as Mr. Stern pointed out, on the, uh, on the currently vacant lot at one time, there was a two family house there. So you're really only increasing um, the use by three dwelling units. Uh, that's potentially six cars over a protracted period of time. So uh, I, I don't see that as a significant impact. There may be traffic movements coming out of Ashwood Court that this other application that you're referring to may have to uh, account for in their analysis. Mr. Steiner, any follow-up for that, uh, for this question? I actually believe it's your income. The, uh, the one application is already almost all the way through and hopefully on the seventh uh, from the plans I've seen, this won't be an issue, but uh, their, their application is done and just awaiting resolution. Yours is not, and therefore, I think that uh, uh, it's incumbent upon you to deal with the, how you're going, your additional cars are going to impact on this. Well, in, in and okay, opinion. that's uh, as I said. If this, uh, by the time we get around to approving your resolution, it'll be resolved one way or the other, because the seventh of May will, uh, the fifth of May will have passed, well, and this I'm board sure. will have done well, it. it I would just like to point out, though, that it's it's what I was trying to say, in my professional opinion, that the increase in traffic from this development is not going to be significant um, and that it's not going to have a negative impact on traffic movements along Ashwood Avenue. And that's exactly what the attorneys for Ashwood Court said to the other folks and what it would have done to that. And they were ha unhappy with even half the numbers. So uh, we wound up in court over this. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Thank you. Uh, any other questions first from members of the board for the, with respect to engineering testimony? If not, I see Ms. Skerlick, if you'd like to hop off mute and you can ask your question again re regarding ideally engineering testimony. Thank you. Um, we live at Nine Russell Place, it's Dr. Gorlick. Um, I wanna talk about the school traffic. There, Jefferson School is on the street. Um, Russell Place is also a cut through for the traffic with the school, adding six additional garages with the 12 additional cars. And let's face it, if it's a four bedroom house, people are gonna move in. And if they have teenagers, there's gonna be more than two cars. We all know that for Summit. Plus the parking lot next to us behind our house uh, for bridges. 
Um, we came to a zoning board meeting when you rezoned the house next to it a few years before. Uh, and that was supposed to be zoned with uh, regard to traffic and with regard to parking for the residents that live at, uh, if we are nine, then it's seven, Russell. And that- I'm Sorry, sorry, Dr. Groh, just did you have a question regarding the, this testimony? Was agreed to that by, your, by this board wasn't followed. They were supposed to get the, the have garage- a question, Ms. Dr. Gorlick, sorry. So, so, so I, I think the question is, you know, it seems like the traffic patterns are not a determinant of the zoning board. And, and the question is, why not? And, you know, it's, it, it's become, it's become an issue in the neighborhood. It goes back to the neighborhood issue. It's a life. So, so it's, it's just, you know, it's kind of disregard for the, the broader community. That's the perspective. And the quality of life. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the uh, testimony and comments rather than questions of uh, Dr. Gorlick and her uh, companion uh, are such that they do not relate to this application uh, because the traffic considered to be developed by this application is by any standard de minimis uh, in connection with the uh, surrounding neighborhood and with regard to the trip generation created by the proposed plan. Maybe Mr. Lanzafama as a civil engineer and address that in a way at this point in advance of his planning testimony since the topic has come up. Well, I, I believe that I had opined uh, on the potential impact of you know, three, two family houses along Ashwood Avenue. It's permitted within the zone. Um, and I think when uh, municipalities draft ordinances and develop master plans, when they determine that a use might be appropriate for an area, they normally take into account the potential traffic generation that it might generate. So as I said, I, I don't see this having a huge impact uh, on the Ashwood Avenue traffic patterns. Mr. Lodzafami, you used the word a huge impact. How about, do you believe that it would have a measurable impact? No, it would not. Thank you. Any other questions for the engineer? All right, let's uh, allow Mr. Lodzafami then to put on his planning hat. Mr. I Sheehan, have a question. Want. I think oh, Mr. Sure. Walker had a question. Oh, Mr. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. You're just going to state your name and address for the record before asking your question. Yeah, Bill Walker, W-A-L-K-E-R. I live at 15 Russell Place, <clears throat> which is the property immediately behind the property under consideration. I have a question about um, elevation and drainage, just to understand a little bit better. Uh, from the from the picture of the of the house, it looks like you drive in at street level into the garage, but from the floor plan, supposedly in the basement, there's a bedroom and a bathroom. And so I'd like to understand this, is the basement down then below the level of the ground level or how does that work? Yes, the, uh, it's, a, it's a below grade uh, room, similar to a rec room that you might have in a, in a in a typical house, uh, in this case, it's a, an extra bedroom and a, and a bathroom that we often have in our basement areas. Um, the, the final grading hasn't been worked out, uh, but the overall height of the building would be compliant with the ordinance. We'll uh, determine that at the grading uh, level. Um, right now, the topography is such that uh, the area along the back line is the route around elevation 200. And it's, it does, for the most part, slope towards uh, the west, which is towards Ashwood uh, Avenue. There's a small area in the northeast that pitches away from us. And uh, as I said in, in my initial testimony, that we'll be cognizant of that when we develop our grading plans. And we'll make certain that any stormwater runoff from the site 
will be contained and controlled. Um, and uh, the, the intent is not to have the basement built out of the ground, but instead to have it appropriately depressed into the topography. So at what point is such a structure termed a basement versus termed a first story? Um, if it's exposed by more than six feet um, uh, on average, around the perimeter of the foundation, or if it's exposed by more than 12 feet at any one point. Uh, neither of those criteria would, uh, would occur in this particular application. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walker. All right, Mr. Sheehan, let's uh, transition to planning testimony. Mr. Chairman, before we do that, I, I do just want to um, elaborate a little further on the traffic issue, just because I know this was going back and forth and I was able to uh, find some applicable case law. So just really quickly for the benefit of the board, um, there's an appellate division case that dates even as far back to 1984, um, Dunkin' Donuts of New Jersey versus the Turnpike of North Brunswick. The appellate division said it, there was a planning board that the application was in front of. They were without authority to deny site plan approval because of off-site traffic conditions. Um, similarly, there's, there's a, plenty of other citations where it's the same point. Uh, it's only when the traffic conditions of the particular application present a major concern or a safety issue. So again, you know, I, I respect Joe's uh, disagreement there, but I got to reiterate that's you know plenty of case law out there. The offsite traffic conditions should not be considered by the board as it relates to this application here. But it's the street right in front of it. That's not offsite. That's onsite. That's offsite, Joe. That's, uh, we can carry me and, me and that the judge will deal with that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Steiner. We can carry that conversation into the deliberations, certainly. Um, all right, Mr. Sheehan, uh, would you move yeah, us into yeah, plain Mr. testimony? It's well, uh, Mr. Spar, the uh, next witness will be the architect, Douglas Miller, and then the planning testimony will gotcha. tie the bow. It's 9.48 right now. Um, let's see how we do with the architect. We may not get to planning this evening, but uh, let's at least get through the architect's uh, testimony if we can. All right. Would, uh, Mr. DeCola, would you admit uh, Douglas Miller to the platform for the purpose of giving sworn testimony in this matter as an architect? Um, Doug, you're here, right? I'm here, yes. All right, Mr. Miller, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And please state your name, spell your last name for the record. Douglas Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, from AHM Architects, located at 281 Main Street in Milburn, New Jersey. Thank you. And would you briefly summarize your background experience and give three boards you've appeared before aside from Summit? Yes, uh, I'm a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey in good standing. I've been in practice uh, since 1995, licensed since 2000. I've appeared before a number of boards throughout the state uh, surrounding towns such as Milburn, Chatham, and Livingston. I've appeared before. Thank you. Um, any questions from the board or would we like to accept Mr. Miller's credentials at this point? No questions. Uh, we will accept Mr. Miller's credentials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Miller, are you the architect retained by Ofer Stern for services in connection with the property that's the subject of this application, Block 4209, Lots 13 and 14? I am. Before asking you to take the board through the architectural program, uh, for the three, ho three homes proposed, can you please take the board on an architectural tour of the adjacent neighborhood between say Ashwood Court and the railroad trestle using to the extent that you choose the photo array compiled by Mr. Lanza Fama and introduced in these proceedings as A2? Certainly, uh, I like to take the, the board through those houses. Uh, let me share my screen and I can pull up the photo exhibit produced by uh, Mr. Alonzo Fama. So if you can all see that, this is the photo array uh, previously admitted to the board. 
I can see there's an eclectic mix of architectural styles. Um, there's really no unity of the adjacent homes. Uh, they vary from uh, bungalows uh, such as 35 to colonials at 31, uh, 32 and 34 to split levels at uh, 18 Ashwood. Um, there's also a variety of parking configurations uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, say, uh, number 29 has a, has a carport. Uh, you have attached garages at 31 and 18. Uh, some houses have no garages whatsoever, and some have detached garages. So there really is no consistency. Uh, the materiality of the houses vary as well. Um, there's a mix of brick, uh, mostly vinyl siding on the adjacent houses. Uh, some are cedar, some have an accent of uh, brick or stone. But yeah, uh, overall, there is no real consistency in style of the houses. The only real prevailing uh, design element or feature that the houses have are a peak roof and they vary in pitch from approximately six on 12 to 12 on 12. So uh, what we're proposing is kind of in between. And uh, you know, I could take you through what we're proposing unless uh, Mr. Sheen would like me to elaborate more on the fabric of the community. No, I think that you've done a good job on that. Uh, Mr. Miller, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to uh, make reference to the photo montage that was introduced at the end of Mr. Stern's testimony as a one in these proceedings and take us through the architectural program of the proposed improvements for the three two family homes in this application. Let me start with the um, exterior of the house, since I think that has a lot of uh, relevance to um, the streetscape, which we were just, just speaking of. And then we can kind of dig into the floor plans, if that's OK with you. Well, do, do you want to uh, share the screen? All yes. Right. Uh, yes. Can everybody Please. see this? Yes. OK. Um, you can see that, you know, we really tried to enliven uh, the streetscape. We tried to engage the street with uh, attractive facades that are consistent with the neighborhood. You can see we have uh, steeply pitched roofs, um, a variety of materials uh, from clapboards, which is the uh, prevalent material along the street, as well as with some other uh, siding choices that uh, articulate the facade. Uh, we've also used a variety of roof lines here to break down the scale and mass of the house and also create shadow lines, which really uh, create a uh, visual interest on the homes. Uh, each of the houses, although the floor plans are very similar inside, we tried to make them look a little bit different by articulating the facades and uh, changing the materiality and colors. Uh, we can jump over to the floor plans now and kind of take you through those. Um, right, as you go through the floor plans, would you comment on the observation in the uh, planners uh, professional review that the uh, garages do not have a conforming interior measurement. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, where they got that information from. I checked my drawings and scaled them and they are in fact 10 feet wide by 20 foot deep. So they are conforming uh, with the ordinance. Uh, you know, if we move forward with this application and these houses are constructed, I will ensure that the uh, clear dimensions inside the garage are conforming with the ordinance. All right, take us through the interior program at the various floor levels, please. Certainly. Uh, you walk in, there's a nice uh, uh, portico and front stoop, which kind of engages the house to the street. There's a one car garage. Uh, you walk in, um, there's a nice entry hall with a powder room, closet, and then we have an open concept, which is really what uh, people are looking for in a, a modern home. We have a combined kitchen, family, and dining area, um, and each unit is the mirror image of each other. Um, since we're on this plan, uh, this is the uh, lower level or the basement level. Uh, there's a staircase down, there's a play area, with a guest bedroom and bathroom. Uh, you know, back up on the first floor, there's a small uh, landing with steps down to the yard. Um, on our next page is the uh, second floor plan. Second floor plan consists of three bedrooms, uh, one of them being a master suite. Uh, there's a laundry room and a 
hall bathroom. Uh, the upper level is a uh, finished attic space. Uh, we're calling it a loft. It's a multi-purpose space. Uh, it's a space that's very popular now with everybody kind of stuck uh, working from home. So it gives uh, people a place to, you know, get away from the family to, to you know, take care of work calls, or it just gives a, a general additional uh, living space uh, within the home without really changing the overall mass and scale of the exterior of the home. Um, these are the elevations of the house, uh, kind of 2D representation of the uh, rendering that I showed you. So you can see the variety of materials, the mixture of roof lines, which really kind of gives the house uh, visual interest. We try to make sure that it was attractive, not only from the uh, front uh, facing uh, portion or elevation of the house, but also from the sides as well. Now, have you, have you spoken of the attic yet? Yeah, so in the attic, you know, we do have this loft space. And it's interesting the way that the ordinance in town reads is that any space uh, within the house that has a ceiling or a, a height from the floor to the underside of the roof rafters of being seven feet or greater counts as FAR or floor area ratio. So in our case, because of our steeply pitched roofs, um, you know, that are consistent with the character of the neighborhood. And if you read through your ordinance, you know, it is something that is looked favorably upon, you know, creating more steeply pitched roofs. Some of the uh, sections of town prefer an eight on 12 pitch or, or greater. So just by the nature of uh, the, the peak of the roof, you can see we've kind of dashed on top of our elevation, you know, where the ceiling height lines are. And it's, you know, whether we had that space created or not, um, it would contribute to the uh, floor area ratio. So we would in fact have to lower the roof lines quite a bit to eliminate that from the calculation. So we felt that, you know, the aesthetics of the house and creating something that was much more consistent with the fabric of the community would be better off. And, you know, for the 158 square foot max uh, change in FAR, I think the upgrade to the exterior appearance uh, was worth the trade-off. Plus we have the bonus of uh, an additional uh, space within the home. Now, Mr. Mr. Miller, if you uh, reduce the pitch of the roof uh, to say a minimum of six on 12, would that eliminate the floor area ratio? No, uh, we would have to be less than six on 12 to eliminate um, that section of the roof uh, being less than seven feet. All right, but by, by creating the seven foot height, you are not increasing the square footage of usable space in the attic. You are just creating a space underneath the peak that's over seven feet, correct? Exactly. It's, it's, it's not going to change the overall bulk of the house or the appearance. And I think floor area ratio talks about the bulk or the scale of the house and how it's perceived from the community. So by lowering the pitch, we'd actually below, bring it below what is permitted in town as far as the uh, recommended pitch to eliminate this area. So it's just really a factor of you know, having a peaked roof uh, contributes to the overall FAR of the house, not the um, overall mass or volume of the of the house per, as is, it's perceived is it, from the exterior. Is it fair? Is it fair to say that the uh, peak roof is by design uh, to create complementarity with the existing prevailing peak roofs in the neighborhood? Yes, that is the intent of the peaked roof. No further questions of this witness. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I would submit him to the examination of the experts, the board, and the members of the interested public. Questions first for, uh, from our board professionals, Mr. Dower, Mr. Snekis of the architects. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, just a few questions for the architect. Um, so just to clarify, the additional 150 square feet roughly of additional FAR is the area of seven feet that's in attic space. It's not really the loft space itself. 
It is the loft space, yes. That's the area that we're considering. So it is actually the loft space. It's not actually just, just standard attic space then. Correct. Um, but yet your testimony would still stand from the standpoint of even though if you didn't finish off that space, you would have the architectural features of the roof lines of the buildings. And so therefore it's really a, uh, a feature of the overall square footage in that same roof space. Um, correct. It's not adding to the visual bulk of the building per se. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, going back to the exhibit you used of the streetscape, and I think Mr. Lanza Palma used it as his exhibit. I noticed that on building thir uh, number 32 and 29, and I'm not sure if you can pull that up at this point, um, there was a feature on the roof, and this might seem small, but it seemed to be reoccurring in some of the buildings. Um, this set, it looks like photograph number two. There's a peak element there. Up at the peak, there's sort of a little um, uh, eave, or excuse me for lack of architectural uh, term, but that feature there, is that anything to be repeated in the architecture or is that something of an origin of architectural style? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the only house on the street that I believe has that little- if you look uh, at actually 30, uh, 29, I think also has that as well. I didn't know if that was a characteristic of building form or not. You could see it there. No, I think they were maybe uh, just the architectural elements of whoever the developer was of those houses at the time, maybe incorporated that feature into the homes. All right. Not something that we're proposing on our design. Okay. In your conceptual rendering that you had, the colorations and the variations of materials, is that the final colors that you're proposing or your, your testimony is more to say that this will be an indication of the variety of the buildings? It is an indication of the variety. Uh, we haven't finalized uh, the colors yet, but uh, you know, we thought that this was a nice uh, uh, mixture of colors that would complement the community. Okay, but it helps avoid the anti look alike or other aspects of, of zoning that we have in place. It does, yes. We're trying to you know, vary the roof colors uh, and the siding colors to do that. Back to your floor plans and the basement space. I noticed you have the guest bedroom in that lower level um, and you have a shower in that bathroom that's associated with the guest bedroom. I guess that's for the convenience of the guest bedroom? Correct but there's no intention to ever use that as a separate unit in the buildings. Um, I'm not trying to imply that you are, it's just a matter of making sure that's clear for the record. Right, yeah, there is no intent to have that as a separate unit. Um, the only way to access it is through the unit above, so it really couldn't have been separated to be a separate living unit. There's no exterior entrance. It would be more of a, uh, I guess, an accessible window? Correct. Fire, fire reasons, okay. Thank you, no further questions. Any questions from members of the board for the architect? Scanning through. Any questions from members of the public for the architect? Okay, seeing none. Oh, yep, Dr. Gorlick. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, the uh, the attic space you you call it a loft. Is that is that intended to be a living space or a storage space? A living space. A living space. Okay. So all right, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of the architect? All right. It's just past 10, but we're getting close with this case and I've consulted with Mr. Nicola and uh, it wouldn't be likely that we can hear uh, this case again until July into the depths of summer. So uh, Michelle, as long as your fingers are okay, we'd like to go a little bit longer, maybe another 15, 20 minutes if we can. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sheehan, let's Thank proceed you, the planning Mr. testimony. I would ask that uh, Michael Lanza Fama be recalled to the platform to give testimony as a planner in connection with this matter. Uh, yes, Mr. Sheehan, I'm, I'm back and uh, I acknowledge I'm still under oath and um, putting my planning hat on for the moment. Um, first uh, variance that I would like to discuss is the lot area variances. 
Um, as you are aware, um, we're looking for uh, roughly 330 square feet per lot. Um, in my mind, this is a T C2 variance. Uh, C2 is often referred to as the flexible C variance, which uh, represents a better planning alternative than strict conformance uh, with the ordinance. Um, as far as the positive criteria goes, um, in, in my mind, what I see is uh, a, a general welfare advantage. Um, that's 40 colon 55 D-2A. Um, it advances the goals of the state master plan, which is to develop new home site opportunities in areas where infrastructure already exists, often referred to as infill development. Um, 40 colon 55 D dash 2G to provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of residential uses to meet the needs of all New Jersey citizens. Uh, this provides for uh, reasonably modestly sized homes and rental opportunities in the two family market. Uh, 40 colon 55 D dash 2I to promote a desirable visual uh, environment through creative development techniques and good civic design and arrangements. As you saw from uh, the exhibits, uh, Mr. Miller's renderings uh, of the streetscape, I, I thought were compelling. Um, they gave us, uh, in my mind, a significant improvement uh, over the existing streetscape and will provide for uh, quality housing stock in the area. As far as the negative criteria, I don't see any substantial detriment to the public good. As I said, I think it will promote the streetscape and improve it. Um, the rhythm and spacing of the existing streetscape will be maintained. The massing and character of the neighborhood is preserved. Lot sizes are consistent with the neighborhood as I demonstrated with the average area and width analysis that we performed of uh, the general neighborhood. Um, the ex, uh, the, so in my mind that this, the variance for the lots themselves for the areas is, is not inconsistent with the, with the zoning ordinance in as much as uh, the variance requested is truly de minimis and that the sites are consistent with the average lot analysis uh, that we had performed. As to the D4 variants associated uh, with the FAR, that's a habitable floor area uh, ratio requirement. And this is a matter of the intensity of use and uh, the criteria in the FAR variances is addressed pursuant to the Randolph Town Center case, uh, which follows the square criteria. Using that criterion, the applicant must show that the site can accommodate the increase in FAR without substantial detriment to the public zone plan. Uh, the applicant must show that the site will accommodate uh, any problems that might be associated with a larger floor area than permitted by the ordinance. Um, the usual problems that you have to overcome are overcrowding on the site, the loss of light, air, or open space, along with the neighboring properties are overwhelming the neighborhood. And uh, what you can see here from the new homes and from what uh, uh, Mr. Miller has developed uh, for this plan is that um, uh, he's done a great job to integrate the excess mass so as to maintain the character of the neighborhood. Um, and when you look at the properties, Architect is breaking up the mass. He steps back the second floor, modulates the roof lines. It's not an over-intensification. Keep in mind, there's no setback variances here. We're compliant as to lot coverage. We're compliant as to building height. So the impact of the 158 square feet plus or minus that we're asking for uh, on the FAR is really one associated with aesthetics that the aesthetic treatment of the house results in the greater height uh, in the attic space that would not normally be counted with a much flatter roof line. So in my opinion, I believe that um, the FAR variance as well can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good or the intent and purpose of your zone plan. Now, Mr. Lodzafama, I'd like to ask you one question. 
the comments and questions from the interested public have all come from properties owned uh, by residents facing on Russell Place, whose rear yard adjoins the property in question. And the issues have been raised in terms of increased density and stormwater runoff. And I ask you whether or not the stormwater runoff will be managed in such a way so that there will be no additional stormwater runoff from this lot, from these lots uh, to the east on Russell Place. Yes, that has been my testimony. We, we will be able to manage that and to ensure that we manage it. Um, the city's engineering department will review our lot grading plans for compliance with uh, the resolution of approval, as well as good stormwater management techniques. Uh, in addition, um, as I pointed out in my earlier testimony, uh, the buildings will be set back approximately two and a half times what is normally permitted in the zone, 77 feet versus 30 feet. And we are going to provide, and Mr. Linson will review and approve a detailed landscaping plan that would not only provide fencing, but evergreen screening as well. So I, I believe the impact on adjoining property owners would truly be de minimis, if at all. When you say property owners, you speak generally. I ask you specifically, what will the impact be on the density and stormwater to the properties to the east, that front on Russell Place and back into the subject site? There will be no impact on them. Thank you, Mr. Lanzafama. I have no further questions of Mr. Lanzafama as a planner and submit him to the examination of the experts, the board, and the members of the interested public. Mr. Let's start with Mr. Dower. Any questions for uh, Mr. Lanzafama here as a planner? Not, none at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mr. Snickis, any questions for Mr. Lanzafama wearing his planning hat? Uh, no, I, I, I just have to uh, ask him to clarify one thing. Um, with regard to your testimony, um, I'm not sure from a planning standpoint, if you tied in the average lot width and the average lot area into your testimony. I know you indicated it through your engineering testimony, but I thought you should relate it to your planning testimony as well. Yes, I, I believe I had mentioned that in, um, in the analysis that I had done um, that the, in demonstrating that there's no negative uh, impact to the, to the zoning plan in as much as we meet that criteria uh, of the ordinance where we looked at the, the neighborhood, the three lots to our left, our right, and across the street and found that the average of those were well below uh, what we are proposing in the form of lot area and were below the uh, lot width of, of 59.33 feet that we're proposing for our site. So in, in my mind, we were clearly consistent with the neighborhood character. And in striking your average, Mr. Lanzafama, you used the 14,000 plus square foot uh, lot that's uh, devoted to the off street, off street parking for the Oak Center as well, correct? That's what I did, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the applicant's witness has provided the testimony in accordance with the statutory criteria. Uh, no further question. Okay, questions uh, from board members regarding uh, the planning testimony. Any questions? No. Okay. Any questions from members of the public with regard to the planner and the planner planning testimony? Mr. Walker, like to hop off? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> with these uh, th three houses being as close together as they are and each having uh, two garages and, and their driveways, uh, what is the impact on street parking? Um, and what's the implication of that with the amazing amount of traffic that goes down that street uh, to the traffic light? Well, uh, keep in mind the way we space the homes, they're, they're actually in excess of the required side. 
So instead of being 14 feet apart, as would be permitted uh, under the zoning, we're, we're nearly 21 feet apart. So that gives us the ability to provide some spacing. So there would be the ability uh, to have some uh, on-street parking, but I don't believe parking permit on this side. I'm, I'm trying to remember when I was out there, I, I don't recall uh, seeing anybody parked along that side of Ashwood Avenue. Yeah, one of the issues is if you have two cars in the garage and two cars in the in front of the garage and you got to rotate your cars, you got to put them somewhere. And uh, to do that with the amount of traffic on that street will be uh, rather tricky. Right. Any uh, further questions with regard to planning testimony? All right, let's go to, I see Mr. Olam down there. Yep, Dr. Gorlick. Sorry, you're just off screen. And then yeah, back yeah, to just, Liz, just, Linda. Just quick, yeah, just a quick question. Yeah, just a question. I, I'm curious why um, all adjacent properties to the property in question weren't considered when this plan was developed. Is that, I, I just don't know. I mean, is that something that's standard here in Summit or is it, is this just sort of a one-off and you're only looking at Ashwood Avenue not looking at other adjacent properties. Just curious. Yeah, the, the, the ordinance uh, dictates what they consider um, the average neighborhood. Uh, the ordinance specifies that we look at the three lots to our left, the three lots to our right, and the three lots immediately across the street. Okay, I'm just, not the greatest ordinance, but I understand. Hypothetically, if you had done that the other way and had gone ahead and looked at the folks behind, how would that have, do you, do you have any idea how that might have changed your analysis? Um, actually, it would have resulted in uh, lots two, three, and four, which are, looks like nine, 11, and 13 Russell Place, are only 44 feet wide by 105 feet deep. So it, mm -hmm. it would have brought the average down even further. Uh, lot five, which is 15 Russell, is 89 feet wide by 114 feet deep. That's a little bit larger, but it still wouldn't have changed the average dramatically. We still would have been consistent with those lots as well. Mr. Lanzafama, Linda, yes. Um, a small question. Please. Would you need to seek this variance if you only built single family houses on those three lots rather than double family houses, two family houses? We would not need a lot area variance because right. the, the lots, the requirement would only be 5,000 square feet. And these are lots are almost twice that number. But they're um, not within the standards that we have here in Summit, which is why you're here to get a variance. That's correct, ma'am. And that was my testimony that um, this, the state, the, the municipal land use law allows for deviations and ordinances because they can't always predict every circumstance. And that sometimes deviations from those standards are to the benefit of, of the community and the state overall. And that was my argument is that um, we need quality housing in this state and we need um, some smaller homes as well as larger homes. So we need a variety of housing stock. And, and that's what granting of this variance does. It allows that opportunity to occur. And when we look at the state's master plan, they are promoting that this infill type of development be encouraged because you already have uh, sewer facilities, water facilities, and, and you're not, you're avoiding the suburban sprawl that happened in the 60s and 70s that decimated our, our woodlands and our, our aquifers. So this is the thought process that we feel is in the best interest of the community and the state. And you've done an analysis that increasing the usage of your water connections and your sewer lines um, to go from one existing usable home to six homes is acceptable. Yes, it's not going to have a significant increase. This, the system but is it will have some increase. 
Oh, absolutely. It'll have a five-fold increase. No, and, not, not, and there's connection not. fees that are required to be paid by each connection that helps um, increase and improve the infrastructure. And you have more tax rateables. So there's a whole litany of things that, that the state and the municipality look at when they develop mm -hmm. these ordinances. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Any other questions for the planner? Okay, Mr. Sheehan, not seeing any. Any other, you don't think you have any further witnesses for this evening, is that correct? And no further witnesses, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, so we would like to provide the public then the opportunity to um, share their comments on the application uh, in favor or in opposition or something in between. Um, so with that, we'll invite you to raise your hand and share um, any comments you might have. Yep, Dr. Gorlick or Mr. Olm. Again, awesome. well, Thank you know, I will uh, ask you to raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And please state your name, spell your last name. My last name is O-L-L-O-M. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, this is probably a broken record, but, you know, my, my comment is we've got enough density in this neighborhood. It impacts traffic. I see this project is significantly increasing it. As others have said, Many, you know, there, are, there have been several other projects recently ongoing and past projects that have had a significant impact in this neighborhood. And it, it just feels to me like, you know, the, not the micro neighborhood, but the broader neighborhood is being negatively impact, impacted by these high density housing projects. And, and we both know, we all know that that's going to add significant volume to uh, you know, to traffic, to parking. Parking's already an issue around here. So you know, it, it, it's you know, the, the laws are the laws, the ordinances are the ordinances. But you know, I just can't be in favor. You know, the neighbor, we we got to put our foot down sometime, man. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it's just enough is enough. So it's it, this is you know. This is the third in the last three years, you know, in this local neighborhood. And I totally disagree that the micro neighborhood is only Ashwood, you know? So that's just my, that's my opinion. And I don't think that this should be voted on in one night. I don't think that that's fair. We found out about uh, this. Sorry, Dr. Gorlick, if you'd like to provide testimony, we just need to swear you in separately. Sorry, are, are you finished Mr. Ohm? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I am totally not in favor of this order, of this project. Okay, all okay. right. Dr. Gorlick, sorry, go ahead. You raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And please also state your name and spell your last name. Risa, G-O-R-E-L-I-C-K, it's underneath my, my screen. Um, I just like, I think that this is way too much to happen in, in a night where you're impacting our lives with another big construction project in our neighborhood. Um, and it's just, it's not fair. I mean, like the, it's kind of ironic that the other projects earlier in this evening were about having like something to keep you from being rained on when you take the groceries out of your house and you don't care about, you know, what, what we haven't like, you know, put that in our neighborhood instead. This is just kind of crazy. We live here. And it's, and I feel like you could do whatever you want to because it's East Summit and we pay taxes too. And you adding all this dense property, it impacts our schools, it impacts class size, it impacts our traffic. It impacts, you know, you're also gonna block our, you know, sunset. I'm not happy and, and, I, and I don't think that we should be voting on this in one night. I think that there needs to be some discussion and some, and some variances and some compromises 
we are okay if you put, I mean, we realize you're going to put a house up behind there. That's fine, but you don't have to add double the houses. Yes, thank you, Dr. Gorlick. Uh, Mr. Walker, we'll swear you in for your comment. Yeah, uh, Bill Walker, W A L K E R. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I would like to ask that there be a traffic study uh, because of the fact that you have a major construction going on, what used to be the, the club there by the railroad. You've got traffic light situation. You have traffic that to avoid the traffic light on Ashland comes up Russell Place. You have uh, inadequate parking and you now have a, another major construction site, which will probably take uh, many months, maybe even a year to finish. Um, I think that until you do that kind of a traffic study, you really don't have all the information to make a complete decision on this project. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Any other members of the interested public uh, care to comment on this application? Okay. Hearing and seeing none. Mr. Sheehan, anything in conclusion you'd like to add before the board proceeds to deliberations? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, uh, defer to the uh, conclusive planning testimony of Mr. Lodzafama and not repeat it because he established the statutory criteria for the relief for the lot area and for the floor area ratio variances, neither of which are of a substantial nature. I would like to reemphasize the advice of council that off-site traffic conditions are not appropriate for consideration in the deliberations on a matter of this type, uh, that if a traffic study were performed, it would, based on objective standards, determine that the traffic impact of the proposed three two-family houses would not be measurable. And when you consider the fact that there have been no residents from Ashwood Road, Ashwood Avenue or Ashwood Court uh, who have spoken in opposition to this application, you wonder why the people on Russell Place who will have no traffic impact from this application, who will have a construction yard replaced with three two-family houses uh, that are set 33 feet more than is required from the Russell Place rear yards. Uh, they might complain about the ordinance. They might complain about East Summit and how they perceive development taking place in East Summit, but their objective concerns do not relate to the property in question. And it is an application based on the administrative reviews that commends itself inherently to the approval of this board. And I would submit it for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board for your patience in concluding this this evening. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, Mr. Ball, before the board enters deliberations, can we just confirm the conditions? Of course, so I have six of them. Um, first is the usual compliance with the conditions noted in the engineer's report. Uh, the second is that the driveway width shall be limited to 18 feet. Third is that the applicant will submit a landscaping plan, which shall specifically include um, the foundation landscaping and street frontage tree selection to be reviewed and approved by the city forester. Fourth is the applicant will fence each lot and will supplement with planting if the fencing is inadequate. Fifth 
is that the stormwater management plan for each individual lot will be submitted to the city engineer for review and approval. And the sixth and final condition is that the board shall retain stormwater jurisdiction for two years. Mr. Ball, uh, who'd like to start us off? Can I ask a question of Mr. Ball? You're welcome to ask a question, please. Um, this is also a subdivision application. Do they have to be voted together or can they be considered separately? It's all voted together. Okay. Maybe Mr. Yuko, would you care to start us off in our deliberations? Okay, I was hoping not to, but okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I found the planning testimony on this case very convincing. Uh, the variances, if you just look at the variances are minimal variances. And I see nothing that suggests there'd be a significant impact, a negative impact on the neighborhood. Um, I think the, the density of these three lots and houses on them, they'll be less dense than the surrounding neighborhood in terms of how close houses are together. Um, the style looks to be in keeping with the houses in the neighborhood. Um, let's see what else I wanna say here. Um, I'm, I appreciate the concession on the driveway um, but I, I think this will be a, a major improvement for the neighborhood, get, getting, getting rid of a vacant lot, putting attractive housing there, which is less dense than, than the rest of, of the block. And uh, so I'm, I'm in favor of the application. Mr. Yuko, Liz, anything you want to add? Um, knowing the neighborhood pretty well, I mean, they took down a two family house that was there before. And I, I can't remember what the other one was. But I think it would be a nice improvement to what was there. Um, you know, I, I, I go back and forth with the traffic um, and with any new development, there is gonna be additional traffic, obviously you have more families, but not to the point where it's going to impede um, as many people, uh, especially on Russell. I think you know, the other townhouses that um, went up that had more of an impact than these will, um, the, the only old Stephen Miller uh, location. But uh, I would be prone to approve this. Okay. Members of the board care to add? Oh, Mr. Steiner, please. Yep. Uh, I have, uh, I am not going to support this application. I believe that uh, one of the things we are doing here is adding six units where we had three. I think what we probably should be doing is upgrading East Summit, trying to get less dense, get more homes on the, uh, uh, you know, get more, more uh, let, less people on the same problem. Well, you know, not not 5,000 square foot lots, but 8,000 square foot lots, 9,000. That's what we should be doing. Uh, having spent an awful lot of time uh, living in the neighborhood and driving uptown uh, every morning for over 20 years down Ashwood and sorry, Russell, um, you know, when it got too bad, you had to go down Russell in order to get out and then go down and get around Springfield Avenue the other way. Uh, we found a way to do it. Uh, and uh, it's just not, this is just not appropriate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Steiner. Any other members of the board care to share their opinion? Okay, I'll just uh, say that um, Mr. Yuko's comments uh, were persuasive for me. Uh, when you review the applicant submissions, I think they're keen to call out as well a discernible positive impact on stormwater management for the property, um, as well as I would believe uh, a positive contribution to the diversity of housing stock um, and certainly the improvement from what is presently um, presently on site at these two lots and what could potentially be if the application is approved. Um, three lots. So with that, I'm prepared to support the application. Um, would first, though, ask for a, a motion um, for, as we do proceed to the vote. I will move to approve with the conditions that Mr. Ball outlined. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Chris? Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Vice Chairwoman Hill? Yes. Mr. Yuko? Yes. Mr. Steiner? No. Mr. Malay? No. Mr. Loikitz? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. 
And Chairman Spur. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. And thanks everyone for your patience this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. And Michelle, we just have two minor administrative items to address and then we're gonna let you go to bed. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, um, first we have a set of minutes from March 15th. Uh, excuse my type. I can't hear you, your tape was ruffling. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so we have a set of minutes from March 15th, 2021, excuse my typo in the agenda. Um, would somebody like to move those? So I'll move them. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. And then secondly, a resolution to switch the contract from Mazer to Collier's Engineering has been circulated to everybody. This is the same language that the Common Council used and it's been reviewed by our QPA and our risk management consultants. So effectively what this will do is transfer the contract to Collier. So would somebody like to move that resolution? So moved. Seconded. All right, uh, I'll just do a roll call for this one, just in case. I'm not sure what you wanna do, Andy, but that's what we'll go with. Um, Chairman Spahn. Yes. Vice Chairwoman Newell. Yes. Yuko. Yes. Mr. Steiner. Yes. Mr. Malay. Yes. Mr. Loikitz. Yes. And Ms. Toth. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Mr. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With did did that, we get thanks. a rate reduction? <laughs> Yeah, right. All right. The with usual that, family discount. That's right. <laughs> Best friends pricing. All right. With that, we're concluded for the evening. See everyone. When are we meeting next, Chris? Is it March 5th the next one? Or March 5th, sorry. May, May 5th. 3rd. 2022. Uh, yeah, we're not booked that far yet, but we're close. All right. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.